Epigraph to Stories of the Victoria Cross. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Stories of the Victoria Cross by Frank Mundell. Epigraph. Thus saith the Queen for him who gave his life as nothing in the fight so he from russian wrong might save my crown my people and my right let there be made a cross of bronze and grave thereon my queenly crest write valour on its haughty scroll and hang it on his breast thus saith the land he who shall bear victoria's cross upon his breast in token that he did not fear to die had need been for her rest for the dear sake of her who gives and the high deeds of him who wears shall high or low all honour have from all through all his years by Sir Edwin Arnold. End of epigraph. Chapter One of Stories of the Victoria Cross by Frank Mundell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Victoria Cross. During the struggle in the Crimea when our soldiers were almost daily performing feats of valour and astonishing the world by their matchless daring queen victoria read with keen interest the reports from the seat of war when she saw how willingly both officers and privates faced the death-dealing torrent of grape-shot and shell not only for the honour of their country but often also that they might carry succour to a fallen comrade she felt that something should be done by way of special recognition of their gallantry something which should also prove an incentive to great and noble conduct on the field of battle accordingly in the year eighteen fifty six her majesty instituted by royal warrant the famous decoration known as the victoria cross in the sign manual issued at the time the following passage occurs now for the purpose of attaining an end so desirable as that of rewarding individual instances of merit and valour we have instituted and created a new naval and military decoration which we are desirous should be highly prized and eagerly sought after by the officers and men of our naval and military services this decoration took the form of a maltese cross in bronze in the centre of the cross is the royal crest and underneath it is a scroll on which are inscribed the words for valour on the reverse side is given a brief account of the deed for which the medal has been awarded the cross is suspended from the left breast of the wearer by a blue ribbon for the navy and by a red ribbon for the army on the bar to which the ribbon is attached is a sprig of laurel and the hero's name the value of the cross amounts only to a few shillings yet there is not a man of any rank in the army or navy who is not proud to be the wearer of this simple maltese cross the decoration is only awarded to those either officers or men who in the presence of an enemy have performed some signal act of valour further in order that all may be on a perfectly equal footing it was decreed that neither rank nor long service nor wounds nor any other circumstance of condition whatsoever save the merit of conspicuous bravery 
shall be held to establish a sufficient claim to the honour the treaty of peace which brought the terrible struggle with russia to an end was signed in eighteen fifty six and on the twenty sixth of june in the same year the first presentation of the victoria cross took place in hyde park in the presence of many thousands of spectators the troops who were to take part in the ceremony were drawn up in line about nine o'clock and those who were to be decorated stood in single file opposite shortly afterwards the firing of guns announced the approach of the royal party the queen mounted on a white horse rode between the prince consort and prince frederick william of prussia afterwards emperor of germany she was dressed in a scarlet tunic with a gold embroidered sash over her left shoulder she also wore a round hat with a gold band and a plume of red and white feathers the heroes who had earned the coveted decoration on many a hard-fought field advanced one by one men of all ranks and ages officers and privates grim and bearded veterans by the side of smooth-faced youths who had just completed their first campaign as each man approached and her majesty stooping from her saddle fixed the cross that bore her name on the hero's breast cheer after cheer arose from the immense throng of admiring spectators after the crosses had been distributed the troops marched past presented arms and gave three cheers for her majesty and the heroes of the day the queen then left the park amidst the hearty cheers of the assembled multitude having added another to those good acts of womanly and queenly grace which had made her name loved and revered throughout the land End of chapter 1chapter 2 of stories of the victoria cross by frank mundell this librivox recording is in the public domain heroes of the alma the first battle of the crimean war was fought on the 20th of september 1854 the russian army was strongly posted on the heights overlooking the river alma and from this commanding position they poured an incessant fire on the british force which was advancing against them with grim determination our men crossed the river scaled the heights and drove the russians from their stronghold many deeds of valour were performed on that eventful day few veterans ever displayed greater courage than did lieutenant lindsay of the scots fusilier guards though he was only twenty-one years of age and this was his first battle lindsay carried the colours of his regiment which drew upon him the fire of the enemy during the passage of the river and while ascending the heights he advanced steadily and unwounded though men fell right and left of him an idea of the danger through which he passed may be formed from the fact that at the close of the day there were found twenty-three bullet holes in the flag and the staff was broken as the regiment neared the russian battery a cry was heard fusiliers retire thinking that the order was intended for them some of the men fell back the officers knowing that the command had been given to another regiment of fusiliers and seeing their own men in the act of retreating did all in their power to correct the mistake no one being more conspicuous in this than lieutenant lindsay in spite of their efforts the soldiers continued to retreat 
but the colour escort under lindsay held their ground and waited till the troops should be brought back to their support while in this position they were attacked by a body of russians and for some moments it seemed as if the little band would be cut to pieces and the standard captured almost all the escort fell but lindsay and another officer stood back to back and kept off the enemy with their revolvers seeing what was going on in front sergeant mckechnie and private reynolds hurried a few men forward and at the same time captain drummond who had been held down by his dead horse rushed to their assistance revolver in hand this little band succeeded in keeping the russians at bay until the troops came up and the colours were saved for their conduct on this occasion lieutenant lindsay sergeant mckechnie and private reynolds received the victoria cross now let us turn to the royal welsh fusiliers several of whom distinguished themselves in this great battle seeing that the russians were abandoning their position ensign anstruther who was but a youth dashed forward with the colours in his hand eager to win glory on that great day in advance of his comrades he gained the redoubt dug the butt end of his flagstaff into the parapet and stood there for a moment looking round him with a triumphant smile but he had already become an object of mark to the russian rifleman and a bullet sent with too true an aim laid him low even in death he did not relax his grasp of the flagstaff and as he fell the silken folds of the banner enveloped his body a glorious pall a colour sergeant named luke o'connor vainly endeavoured to keep pace with the fleet-footed anstruther and was struck down by a shot in the breast before he could gain the top of the parapet the symbols of regimental honour were now in danger of falling into the enemy's hands seeing this one of the soldiers rushed forward and was in the act of taking the colours from anstruther's lifeless grasp when o'connor roused by the thought of losing the honour for which he had striven sprang to his feet seized the flagstaff and proudly set it up again on the redoubt when the movement had succeeded and the position was in the hands of the british the officer advised o'connor to go to the rear where his wound would receive attention but the gallant fellow could not be persuaded to forego the honour of carrying the flag though weak from loss of blood he kept his post till the close of the battle then it was found that the colours had been hit in seventy-five places for this splendid display of courage o'connor received the thanks of his commander on the field and was afterwards decorated with the victoria cross when the british entered the great redoubt they found that the russians had succeeded in carrying off many of their guns and were in the act of removing the remainder captain bell of the royal welsh saw that one of the guns dragged by only three horses had not yet reached the rear of the redoubt in a moment he resolved come what might to capture that gun though on foot he made his way as rapidly as possible after the retreating gun when he came up with it he seized the bridle of the leading horse presented his unloaded pistol at the driver's head and ordered him to dismount though the russian did not understand the words in which the order was given he had no doubt of the meaning they were intended to convey he therefore dismounted and made off without offering the slightest resistance bell instantly turned the gun round but at that moment his superior officer rode up and ordered him back to his regiment for in leaving it 
even to capture a gun he had been guilty of a breach of discipline the captain had of course to obey yet not until he had started the horses in the direction of the british lines where the capture was complete the horses were used in one of our batteries for some time and the gun may still be seen at woolwich for this daring act captain bell received the victoria cross End of chapter two chapter three of stories of the victoria cross by frank mundell this librivox recording is in the public domain heroes of inkerman during the darkness and gloom of a misty november morning about sixty thousand russians climbed the hill on the top of which was encamped the british army of eight thousand men our soldiers were scattered about the hill in small parties little dreaming of the near presence of the enemy but they were soon awakened to the stern reality and had to fight against overwhelming odds not merely for victory but for very life the battle of inkerman has been described as the bloodiest struggle ever witnessed since war cursed the earth it is said to have been a series of dreadful deeds of daring of sanguinary hand-to-hand -hand fights of despairing rallies of desperate assaults in glens and valleys in brushwood glades and remote dells hidden from all human eyes and from which the conquerors russian or british issued only to engage fresh foes till our old supremacy so rudely assailed was triumphantly asserted and the battalions of the tsar gave way before our steady courage some of the most brilliant feats of arms were displayed at the sandbag battery which had been occupied by the russians and from which they sent a deadly fire on the british troops some of the grenadier guards were impatient to seize the battery and one of them cried if an officer will lead us we will charge captain sir charles russell heard him and waving his revolver shouted out come on my lads who will follow me several men at once sprang forward and their brave example stimulated others to join in the charge russell rushed out and encountered a russian at whom he levelled his revolver but it missed fire he pulled again and his opponent fell just then he felt a hand laid on his arm and looking round he saw one of his men who said you were near done for russell answered oh no he was some way from me to this the grenadier replied his bayonet was all but into you when i clouted him over the head it seems that one of the russians had managed to get behind the captain and was in the very act of running him through when the soldier struck him down and thereby saved his officer's life russell then asked the man what was his name and on being told anthony palmer he promised well if i live through this you shall not be forgotten in the desperate struggle which followed the russians surrounded the little band in almost overwhelming numbers and russell had more than one narrow escape in a hand-to-hand -hand struggle with one of the enemy he though by no means a powerful man succeeded in tearing his rifle from him this trophy of his prowess sir charles carried out of the action palmer also distinguished himself by the part he took in defending the colours from falling into the hands of the enemy at length valour triumphed and the russians were beaten sir charles russell and palmer both received the victoria cross 
and palmer was publicly made a corporal on parade next morning we have already seen how a soldier will risk his life in defence of his country's flag now we will give an example of the gallant manner in which he protects his guns from falling into the enemy's hands during the battle of inkerman three guns under lieutenant miller were put in position on some high ground overlooking the scene of conflict scarcely had they been loaded when a small body of british soldiers were pressed back on them by a large force of russian infantry as the guns could not be removed in time lieutenant miller asked the officer in command of the soldiers to help him to defend them he however thought that it would only be a useless waste of life to face the advancing host of russians and continued the retreat miller ordered his men to fire but only one round could be discharged when the enemy were upon them they came on uttering strange joyous cries left without any support miller in despair bade his gunners draw swords and charge he himself under a shower of bullets rode straight for the russians evidently bewildered by this sudden and bold attack they paused for a moment then there followed a short sharp struggle miller and his handful of gunners laid about them furiously with swords and rammers and it is said that one of the men who was a mighty boxer scorned to make use of any other weapons than those which nature had bestowed on him and felled man after man with his fist such an unequal combat could not last and in the end the enemy obtained possession of the guns which however they did not hold for long lieutenant miller came out of the encounter without a scratch and received the victoria cross for his spirited conduct some time after this a gun in charge of sergeant major henry was suddenly surrounded by the enemy he called upon his men to defend their gun and he and another gunner named taylor drew their swords and prepared to resist the enemy attacked them but henry's courage never forsook him he snatched a rifle out of the grasp of one of his antagonists and defended himself with great skill against several others just then taylor was slain and many of the gunners fell surrounded on all sides henry received a bayonet wound in the chest and was almost at the same time stabbed in the back he sank to the ground apparently lifeless but the russians as was their wont still continued to strike at him before he was rescued he received twelve wounds yet he lived to wear the reward of his valour an exploit of wonderful daring and brilliancy secured for lieutenant clifford the honour of the victoria cross observing that the russians had sent a strong force to take one of our regiments in the rear he determined to avert the threatened disaster knowing that there was no time to spare he took upon himself the responsibility of leading the attack calling out to those who could hear him come and charge with me he galloped off and dashed into the midst of the hostile ranks alone for his men not being mounted were some distance behind the russians were as usual bewildered evidently thinking that this single horseman was but the first of a troop of cavalry when they saw that it was not so they began to make a show of resistance but it was of no use clifford and his men were invincible with the strength of a young hercules he thrust and cut and parried and in the midst of it all 
even found time to save the life of one of his men at length the enemy lost heart altogether laid down their arms and gave themselves up as prisoners to a mere handful of men whom they could have with ease annihilated End of chapter three chapter four of stories of the victoria cross by frank mundell this librivox recording is in the public domain the noble six hundred the most brilliant episode in the crimean war was the famous charge of the light brigade at balaclava the magnificence of the feat the desperate gallantry the hopeless miracle of devotion all this is an heirloom which the british army and indeed every british citizen must continue to rate high owing to a misunderstanding of the instructions which he had received lord cardigan ordered the light brigade numbering over six hundred mounted men to charge the russian guns posted at the end of a valley about a mile away and supported by the whole army to obey the order seemed to be certain death as few of that gallant brigade could expect to return yet they advanced as calmly as if on parade for a short distance they proceeded at a trot and then the russian batteries opened fire the trot broke into a gallop and as they neared the enemy the fierce desire of the troopers could no longer be kept in check and they charged at racing speed stormed at by shot and shell while horse and hero fell a more fearful spectacle was never witnessed than that of these heroes rushing into the arms of death the russians fired with great rapidity and deadly accuracy but the horsemen did not halt or even check their speed for an instant they closed up the gaps in their ranks and pressed on with a halo of flashing steel above their heads and with a cheer which was many a noble fellow's death cry they flew into the smoke of the batteries and went crashing through the enemy's lines then the voice of one of the officers was heard clearly above the din of battle shouting now my brave lads for old england conquer or die cossack and russian reeled from the sabre stroke shattered and sundered then they rode back but not not the six hundred just as our men were about to retire an enormous mass of grey-coated lancers were hurled on their flank the colonel of the eighth hussars collected a few men dashed into the midst of the russians and succeeded in cutting his way through with great loss others followed his example and with almost superhuman strength and courage gradually forced their way through the dense throng which encircled them meanwhile the russian artillerymen returned to the guns which they had been forced to abandon and heedless of the fact that their own countrymen were mingled with our men they fired into the struggling mass of humanity thus destroying both friend and foe never before or since has such an atrocity been committed by any civilized nation when the wreck of the gallant brigade mustered after the charge lord cardigan said men it is a mad brain trick but it is no fault of mine never mind my lord the men called out we are ready to go again no no men he replied you have done enough it is impossible to find a greater instance of discipline and devotion to duty of more romantic courage 
or desperate adventure though the charge was productive of no solid advantage it showed that the british heart was as high in spirit and the british arm as strong as in the knightly days of old well might a french general who witnessed the charge exclaim c'est magnifique or it is magnificent when can their glory fade oh the wild charge they made all the world wondered honour the charge they made honour the light brigade noble six hundred one of the many who had their horses shot under them in that fierce ride was troop sergeant major berryman of the seventeenth lancers getting hold of a riderless horse he remounted but almost immediately afterwards the animal dropped dead having been previously wounded seeing that there was no chance of being able to rejoin his regiment berryman determined to return to the rear on his way he saw that one of his officers named captain webb had halted fearing that something was wrong he ran to him and asked what was the matter the captain replied that he had been struck and that his wound was so painful that he could not ride any further berryman called to a passing soldier to hold the horse's head while he lifted the captain down this was done without further accident and the gallant sergeant told the soldier to mount the horse and ride for a stretcher he then sat down beside the wounded officer knowing well the barbarous nature of the enemy and the extreme danger in which he was placed webb told berryman that he had better consult his own safety and make for the rear not at all he replied i'll stay with you now don't mind me look to yourself the officer again urged all right sir but we will go together no matter what happens obtaining the assistance of another soldier they made a chair by crossing their hands and in this way carried the wounded man for some distance till he again complained of the pain of his wound not to be beaten berryman enlisted the aid of a third man to support the captain's legs until a better means of conveyance could be procured at length a stretcher was obtained and webb was taken to the surgeons who dressed his wound but unfortunately he was beyond all human aid and died shortly afterwards sergeant berryman however received the victoria cross for the assistance he had so bravely rendered End of chapter four Chapter Five of Stories of the Victoria Cross by Frank Mundell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Lady with the Lamp. The Victoria Cross has not yet been awarded to a woman, else Florence Nightingale would have received the coveted decoration. She, however, was one of the first to receive the royal red cross the story of self-sacrificing bravery displayed by this devoted woman will never be forgotten our wounded soldiers were huddled together languishing on their rough beds destitute of attention comfort and all necessary remedies everything was in disorder and the appeal of the sufferers for help stirred the mighty heart of the english people in response to that cry florence nightingale with a band of nurses went out to the seat of war before many weeks had passed she brought about an almost miraculous change in the hospitals and where confusion and wretchedness had held sway order and comfort reigned supreme 
she was everywhere at the bedside of the wounded soldier staunching his wound and soothing his pain in the laundry in the kitchen she was ever active and but for her many a poor fellow must have died of her one writer said wherever there is disease in its most dangerous form and the hand of the spoiler distressingly nigh there is that incomparable woman sure to be seen her benignant presence is an influence for good comfort even amid the struggles of expiring nature she is a ministering angel without exaggeration in these hospitals and as her slender form glides quietly along each corridor every poor fellow's face softens with gratitude at the sight of her when all the medical officers have retired for the night and silence and darkness have settled down upon these miles of prostrate sick she may be observed lamp in hand making her solitary rounds as she moved gently about seeing that no sufferer was in want of anything she would speak to one and another wrote a soldier and nod and smile to many more but she could not do it all you know we lay there in hundreds but we could kiss her shadow as it fell and lay our heads on the pillow again content when the war was over and the object of her mission had been accomplished florence nightingale returned to england her fame had gone before her and on her arrival she found herself the heroine of the hour her name was on every tongue and her praises were on every lip many who had never seen her loved her for the care she had taken of those near and dear to them in the hour of their greatest need though she did not receive the victoria cross other honours were in store from the queen she received an autograph letter of thanks and a st george's cross in red on a white ground in the centre of the cross are the letters v r surmounted by a crown of diamonds with the word crimea in gold letters round the cross is a black band on which are inscribed the words blessed are the merciful the nation raised a sum of fifty thousand pounds as a testimonial fund it was devoted to the establishing and maintenance of the nightingale home for the training of nurses santa philomena or saint nightingale a poem by henry wadsworth longfellow whene'er a noble deed is wrought whene'er is spoken a noble thought our hearts in glad surprise to higher levels rise the tidal wave of deeper souls into our inmost being rolls and lifts us unawares out of all meaner cares honour to those whose words or deeds thus help us in our daily needs and by their overflow raise us from what is low thus thought i as by night i read of the great army of the dead the trenches cold and damp the starved and frozen camp the wounded from the battle plain in dreary hospitals of pain the cheerless corridors the cold and stony floors lo in that house of misery a lady with a lamp i see pass through the glimmering gloom and flit from room to room and slow as in a dream of bliss the speechless sufferer turns to kiss her shadow as it falls upon the darkening walls as if a door in heaven should be opened and then close suddenly 
the vision came and went the light shone and was spent on england's annals through the long hereafter of her speech and song that light its rays shall cast from portals of the past a lady with a lamp shall stand in the great history of the land a noble type of good heroic womanhood End of chapter 5chapter six of stories of the victoria cross by frank mundell this librivox recording is in the public domain the gallant nine on the morning of the eleventh of may eighteen fifty seven the day after the outbreak of the indian mutiny the rebels swarmed into the imperial city of delhi where they were quickly joined by the native garrison inflamed with religious zeal and with the blood they had already shed the mutineers rode through the streets carrying all before them and spreading destruction on every side close to the palace stood the largest magazine of military stores in india it contained many heavy cannon an extensive supply of firearms and other weapons and an enormous quantity of gunpowder this magazine was in charge of lieutenant willoughby and under him were lieutenants rayner and forrest conductors scully and buckley four other british soldiers and a number of natives while they were busy with their ordinary duties that morning word came that the mutineers were close at hand and as it was of the utmost importance that they should not gain possession of the stores willoughby at once prepared to defend the post by the excited manner of the native soldiers who were with him he at once concluded that they could not be trusted but he consoled himself with the thought that even without their aid he and his companions might hold out until assistance came it was indeed a desperate resolve for what could nine men do against thousands of infuriated sepoys if they could not hold their own they could at least die like heroes and if help did not come in time they could fire the magazine and bury themselves and their foes in its ruins at least such were the conclusions arrived at by the gallant officer when willoughby informed his companions of the course he intended to pursue he received their instant and hearty approval the gates were closed and barricaded guns were put in position and everything made ready for a determined resistance when their arrangements for the defence of the magazine were complete a train was laid ready to be fired at a given signal when further resistance was impossible shortly afterwards the rebels in the name of the king of delhi demanded the surrender of the magazine to this demand no reply was given and other messages of the same kind were also treated with silent contempt thereupon the king sent word that unless his demands were at once complied with the magazine would be taken by force even this threat failed to extort a reply from the gallant nine determined to obtain possession of the military stores the king ordered the walls to be scaled when the rebels made the attack the sepoys who were inside the magazine joined their countrymen and assisted in the assault the little band of britons received the enemy with a withering fire and though round after round of grape-shot was poured into their ranks the deadly hail seemed to have little effect on the overwhelming numbers the rebels on the walls kept up an incessant fire on the brave defenders who careless of the leaden shower 
loaded and fired the guns as steadily as if shooting at a target how many were slain at this time can never be known for the rebels exposed themselves in the most reckless manner maddened by the resistance of a few englishmen they pressed on confident in their strength and determined to carry the position at all hazards at length all the ammunition that had been brought out was exhausted and as two of the gunners were wounded no one could be spared to fetch more the sepoys were entering the enclosure at various points and shouts of triumph could be heard on all sides it was no longer possible to prevent the stores of arms and ammunition from falling into the enemy's hands then willoughby gave the signal to fire the train this was done by scully in a few seconds there was a sullen roar followed by a tremendous explosion it seemed as if the very earth was splitting to its foundations over the palace and the city a shadow seemed to fall as the contents of the magazine ascended into the air a cloud of white smoke streaked with dark objects a shower of bodies of stones cannon shot shell and bullets and the heroic deed was accomplished over five hundred of the mutineers perished not one of the gallant nine ever expected to live to tell the tale scully and four of his companions were never seen again the remaining four however escaped from the scene of the explosion though terribly scorched and wounded forrest rayner and buckley reached meerut thirty-four miles distant in safety willoughby however was not so successful while hiding in the jungle he was captured by the natives and put to death thus ended one of the most patriotic acts recorded in the annals of war the effect of this heroic deed which has given to those gallant nine a cherished place in history can never be exactly computed but the grandeur of its conception is not to be measured by its results from the one end of india to the other it filled men's minds with enthusiastic admiration when the news reached england that a young officer named willoughby had blown up the delhi magazine there was a burst of applause that came from the deep heart of the nation it was the first of many intrepid acts which have made us proud of our countrymen in india but its brilliancy has never been eclipsed forrest rayner and buckley received the victoria cross for their share in this splendid exploit the first for which it was given in the indian mutiny End of chapter 6chapter seven of stories of the victoria cross by frank mundell this librivox recording is in the public domain three to one during the siege of delhi the english force in front of the city was startled by the appearance of a large body of sawars or native cavalry making towards a piece of high ground to the rear of the camp called the mound here were posted three heavy guns a picket of infantry and thirty lancers under lieutenant martin some distance in front of the mound there was a cavalry picket and two guns of the horse artillery in charge of lieutenant hill as the sawars still wore the british uniform they were at first thought to be friends but this mistake was soon discovered and caused a panic among the cavalry picket who turned and fled thereupon the majority of the rebels dashed into the camp and attempted to seize the heavy guns 
but they were met by a spirited resistance from martin and his thirty lancers the enemy came within fifty yards and circled round but they were met by the lancers at every turn finding it impossible to capture the guns they withdrew meanwhile lieutenant hill in charge of the two horse artillery guns was faring badly like the other officers hill had at first supposed that the approaching horsemen were friends and when he discovered that they were rebels he at once exerted himself to bring his guns into position it was however too late the sawars were upon him hill's next thought was how to prevent the guns falling into the hands of the rebels and to achieve this he was ready to sacrifice himself driving his spurs into his horse he charged the enemy with tremendous fury hacking and hewing right and left two sawars charged him at the same moment and so great was the shock of the collision that both horse and rider were hurled to the ground though stunned by the fall the hardy lieutenant instantly sprang to his feet seized his sword and stood at bay three of the rebels advanced to attack him two mounted and one on foot though short of stature and breathless with his recent exertions he quickly put the two mounted men out of the fighting list severely wounding the one and killing the other the sawar on foot however fresh and active was yet to be dealt with the day had been wet and hill was encumbered by his heavy riding cloak twice he tried to discharge his revolver but each time it missed fire he also made a desperate thrust with his sword but his arm caught in the cloak and the blow fell short then with wonderful dexterity the rebel seized the weapon and snatched it out of the grasp of his adversary though disarmed and spent with changing blows the plucky lieutenant would not give in closing with the rebel and thus preventing him from using his sword hill made a free use of his fists and it seemed as if the tide of fortune was about to turn when he slipped on the wet ground and fell in another moment all would be over the sawar raised his arm to deal the fatal blow when suddenly the report of a pistol rang out the uplifted arm dropped powerless and as the rebel fell a crimson streak on his white tunic told that a bullet had found its mark who had fired the shot major toombs the captain of the artillery troop on ascending the mound had his attention arrested by the sight of his junior officer lying on the ground entangled in his cloak while a rebel stood over him about to give him a final blow thirty yards separated the major and the officer and before he could cover the distance the rebel would have completed his work he therefore decided to risk a shot resting his revolver on his left arm he took a steady aim and fired with the result already known the moment toome saw that his shot had been successful he hurried up and helped hill to rise as they stood talking the lieutenant observed a sawar making off with his revolver which he had dropped in the conflict roused at the thought of losing his weapon and forgetting the severe exertions and terrible danger through which he had just passed the lieutenant dashed after the retreating rebel determined to recover the revolver major toombs followed finding that he was pursued the sawar turned and stood at bay he aimed a blow at hill but he turned it aside and toombs did the same when the rebel made a desperate attempt to cleave his skull 
the native rushed again upon hill and delivered a blow with such fury that his guard was broken down and he received a deep wound on the head and fell senseless to the ground he next turned his attention to tombs who parrying his cut ran him through the body major tombs and lieutenant hill both received the victoria cross End of chapter 7chapter eight of stories of the victoria cross by frank mundell this librivox recording is in the public domain humane and brave one of the most thrilling incidents of the mutiny was the defence of arar twelve europeans and a small force of sikhs were shut up in a two-storied dwelling-house and bravely withstood the repeated attacks of thousands of sepoys for about a week before help arrived an attempt was made to relieve the little band sooner but it ended in failure a force of four hundred men under captain dunbar embarked on the ganges at dinapur twenty-four miles distant to go to the help of the besieged at seven in the evening they landed and began their march all went well till within three miles of their destination when a murderous fire was opened on them from behind a thick grove of trees the soldiers fell thick and fast for they were on high ground while the foe lurked unseen captain dunbar was among the first to fall and after that all was confusion and slaughter after a time our men rallied and sought refuge in a hollow but they were still exposed to the fire of the lurking foe at daybreak the little band decided that their only hope of safety lay in retreat so exhausted hungry and dispirited they began to retrace their steps from behind every tree as it seemed poured the leaden hail but they kept steadily on towards the river at length they were seized with panic and the sole desire of each man was to save his own skin but disastrous as was the retreat it was not all disgraceful there will always be acts of individual heroism when englishmen go out to battle it may be a soldier or it may be a civilian in whom the irrepressible warrior instinct manifests itself in some act of conspicuous gallantry and devotion but it is sure never to be wanting amongst those who accompanied the relief expedition were ross mangles and macdonnell both members of the civil service on the march they gave great assistance and acted as guides when the firing began mangles was stunned by a musket ball but he soon recovered and busied himself in helping the surgeon to bind up his comrades wounds and in carrying water to ease the burning agony of their thirst when the retreat began he inspired those near him with hope and courage by his resolute bearing he managed to keep near him a small knot of men who supplied him with a succession of loaded muskets as he was a dead shot the sepoys thought proper to keep their distance he seemed to bear a charmed life for though men fell round him on all sides he was untouched about six miles from the river a soldier of the thirty seventh regiment who had been wounded and left helpless on the ground begged mangles not to leave him to be butchered by the sepoys he did not ask in vain kneeling down amid the storm of musketry mangles bound up the man's wounds lifted him upon his back and marched on with his burden 
though he had not broken his fast for twenty-four hours nor closed his eyes in sleep for forty-eight he afterwards declared that he had never felt so strong in his life over the rough and swampy ground he bore his helpless charge though frequently obliged to lay down his burden and rest even then he stood over the wounded man and fired at the rebels whenever he had a chance at last the weary six miles were covered and the river was reached then swimming out and holding up the helpless man in the water mangles got him safely into one of the boats he afterwards saw him into good hands at the hospital at dinapur with leisure to thank god and his preserver for his almost miraculous deliverance the soldier's name was richard taylor and several months passed before he was able to leave the hospital and to be sent back to england mangles was not rewarded for his gallantry at the time but about twelve months later his deed was brought to light by the journal of a surgeon in which was recorded the gratitude of the wounded soldier mangles afterwards received the victoria cross he had so richly deserved the modesty which allowed the event to remain unknown to those in authority for so long a time is not the least remarkable feature in the story equally heroic was the exploit of macdonnell always in the front and always in the thick of the fight he greatly distinguished himself and many a rebel fell beneath his unerring fire though wounded he fought with the same dashing gallantry during the retreat on reaching the river he assisted those more severely wounded than himself to embark then when all were on board he entered the last boat the breeze was blowing favourably for their escape and deliverance seemed to be at hand but the rebels had taken away the oars and tied the helm so that the boat was carried back again towards the bank it had just left a shower of the enemy's musket balls came thick and fast certain destruction stared the weary soldiers in the face macdonnell seeing the state of affairs called upon the men to cut the ropes which prevented the rudder from being worked secure under the covered roof of the boat the men would not stir macdonnell then went out on to the roof knife in hand and cut the fastenings of the rudder amid a very storm of bullets from the bank some of which passed through his helmet but did no other damage then seizing the tiller he guided the boat to the opposite side of the stream in safety thus saving the lives of thirty-five men we may judge of the peril in which he was placed when we know that during the passage of the river three men were shot dead and three severely wounded macdonnell afterwards received the crowning glory of the victoria cross End of chapter 8chapter 9 of stories of the victoria cross by frank mundell this librivox recording is in the public domain a brave surgeon when the relieving force under general havelock entered the residency of lucknow they were compelled to leave many of the wounded behind them in the streets of the city in the care of surgeon home for fear that they might fall into the hands of the sepoys a number of soldiers were sent to guard them on their way to the residency a start was made and for a short distance all went well while crossing a stream the rebels opened fire on the refugees some of whom were shot while others were drowned 
the greater number however managed to reach the other side and were borne into what appeared to be a deserted street but it was in reality lined with sepoys no sooner had they entered than a storm of musketry assailed them from the tops of the houses the escort and the litter bearers most of them natives fell fast and the remainder flung down their burdens and fled for their lives in this emergency dr home tried to make use of those who were not quite disabled by their wounds and of the remainder of the escort in carrying the wounded but the enemy were mustering on all sides and it was impossible to go farther dr home and four men rushed into a house close at hand where they were afterwards joined by two wounded officers and a few men of the escort the house in which they had taken refuge was a one-storied building with a large number of windows here they were soon surrounded by nearly a thousand sepoys who made several desperate attempts to reach them they were however repulsed each time chiefly by the heroic exertions of a private soldier named mcmanus he took up a position outside behind the shelter of a pillar and kept up an incessant fire on the rebels until he was wounded meanwhile dr home and his few followers made a barricade of sandbags by digging up the earthen floor of the house with their bayonets and using the dead sepoys clothes to hold the soil unable to gain possession of the house the natives turned on the wounded who were lying helpless in the litters and proceeded to massacre them as was frequently the case during the indian mutiny the blackness of disaster was lighted up by a display of genuine heroism roused to madness by the cries of the wounded mcmanus whom we have already mentioned and private ryan rushed out of the house to try and rescue some of their comrades heedless of the fire of the rebels they went backward and forward several times and succeeded in bringing in several of the wounded it is a singular fact that neither of these gallant fellows were hurt while performing this humane act they afterwards received the victoria cross the duties which fell to the lot of dr home at this time were neither few nor light as the only unwounded officer he had to command and encourage the men as the surgeon he had to attend to the wounded and as a man he had to use his rifle with the rest and right well did he discharge his responsibilities finding that they could not achieve their object by force the sepoys tried stratagem stealthily creeping up to the windows they fired in but without success as our men threw themselves on the floor and the shots passed harmlessly over them the doctor then placed a man at each window and three to guard the door after a time a sepoy crept up very cautiously to the window at which dr home was standing quite unconscious that his every movement was being watched he raised his rifle to fire when a shot from the doctor's revolver laid him on the ground never to rise again the rebels now drew off and contented themselves with firing an occasional volley this continued for about an hour when a dull rumbling noise was heard in the street thinking they were about to fire a cannon into the building home called out now men now or never let us rush out and die in the open air and not be killed like rats in a hole they are bringing a gun on us the soldiers prepared to obey his orders 
when they saw that it was not a gun but a screen on wheels with thick planks in front through which no bullets could pass the rebels brought the screen close up to the house and in less than half an hour they succeeded in setting fire to the roof hoping in this way to seal the fate of those within they however escaped by breaking through into the second room which led into a large square here they found a shed into which they carried their wounded and made preparations for further resistance unfortunately the shed had been used as a cover for the rebels from which they fired on the relieving force and was loopholed everywhere so that the position of holmes party was indeed perilous a man was placed at every loophole and even the wounded were put to watch this says dr holm soon checked the bold brave sepoys for whom one british soldier is an object of terrible dread fresh trouble however was in store the mutineers got on to the roof bored holes in it and fired into the sheds nothing more wonderful in the way of narrow escapes was ever seen two shots were fired at the surgeon within four feet of his head but he received no injury beyond a slight wound in the hand about fifty yards from the shed was a mosque which if it could only be reached would afford a more substantial shelter accordingly a hole was broken through one of the sides of the shed and under cover of darkness dr home and one of the soldiers crept cautiously out to examine the building by crawling on all fours the surgeon succeeded in reaching the mosque and found it empty but before the wounded could be conveyed thither their movements were discovered and they had to remain where they were home however secured a supply of water which was a priceless treasure the wounded were dying with thirst and those who had been fighting all day were almost as bad fortunately the water was sufficient to give every man a good draught the terrors of that awful night were almost maddening raging thirst uncertainty as to where the sepoys would next make an attack together with the exhaustion produced by want of food heat and anxiety the welcome dawn at length chased away the night but it brought no relief worn out with the strain of the past twenty-four hours the men abandoned themselves to despair all at once a sharp firing was heard outside which sounded like the report of british rifles ryan who was sentry shouted out oh boys them's our chaps no sooner had he spoken than a regular rattling volley rang out such as no sepoys could give the men who a moment before were longing for the welcome release of death sprang to their feet all fire and animation men cheer together cried the gallant home and a joyous shout was raised those outside heard it and replied with a ringing cheer that struck terror into the hearts of the rebels five minutes later the work of rescue was completed and all were saved for this conspicuous devotion home received the victoria cross and surely it was never conferred on one more worthy of the honour end of chapter nine chapter ten of stories of the victoria cross by frank mundell this librivox recording is in the public domain the hero of kolapore 
one evening in july eighteen fifty seven several officers of the south Maratha horse stationed at satara were discussing the mutiny and wondering if it would extend to that part of the country all indulged in gloomy forebodings except one young officer who took a more hopeful view of the situation this was lieutenant kerr of the south Maratha horse an officer who had already secured the confidence and respect of the wild troopers under his command he expressed his conviction that however treacherous the other troops might prove he could always count upon the loyalty of the south Maratha horse and if any emergency should occur it would be seen that their courage was equal to their loyalty he had scarcely finished speaking when a telegram was handed to the commanding officer the door was carefully closed to prevent the servants from hearing for at that trying period every native was suspected of being a rebel in disguise it proved to be a message from kolapur a town about seventy miles distant saying that the native infantry had mutinied and murdered every officer on whom they could lay their hands some however had escaped and taken refuge in the residency where they were protected by a few faithful native troops food they had none and unless help came speedily they would be compelled to surrender and if they fell into the hands of the enemy a lingering death by the most horrible tortures was certain to be their fate the commanding officer hesitated for a moment as he was doubtful whether he could trust his men if they were sent to kolapur but kerr assured him that they were perfectly trustworthy and volunteered to lead a party of the south Maratha horse to the rescue half an hour later he left satara at the head of fifty horsemen all that could be spared though his force was so small the gallant lieutenant never for a moment doubted the success of his enterprise it was in the middle of the wet season rain descended in torrents the district was flooded and the small streams had become rivers the road between the two stations was not a road as we understand the term and the horses often sank up to their knees in mud but the dauntless cur and his little band pushed on they were obliged to swim across five rivers and seven ravines filled with water but at length all obstacles were overcome and in twenty-six hours they reached kolapur scorning the handful of men that had come against them and half mad with murder and plunder the mutineers looked upon victory as certain they took up a position in a strong square fort with a massive gate at the entrance kerr was now in a very critical position he had no guns except a couple which he had borrowed from a neighbouring rajah and these were useless night and darkness were at hand his troopers were now ready and eager for the fray but if he put off the attack till morning there was a danger that they might then be afraid to follow him dismounting his men he selected seventeen of whose bravery and faithfulness he was well assured and led them to the attack then the lieutenant and his right-hand man who bore the singular name of gumpunt rao dao kerr armed themselves with crowbars and heedless of the bullets which whistled around them soon made an opening in the first door large enough for one man to crawl through on his hands and knees kerr and his men at once crept through 
and their appearance was the signal for a tremendous volley from the sepoys but it passed harmlessly over their heads without giving the rebels time to reload kerr rushed on them followed by his men a fierce hand-to-hand -hand fight followed but in the end the rebels with great loss were driven into a house which covered the second entrance as this building was loopholed a brisk fire was kept up on the little band which rendered the storming of the fort more difficult finding one side on which there were no loopholes kerr got close to the building and succeeded in setting it on fire several of the enemy perished in the flames and the remainder retreated into the inner part of the fort where they were joined by the whole garrison kerr and his men followed and found that another door had to be battered in before they could effect an entrance again the crowbar was brought into use and as before an opening was made in rushed the gallant lieutenant closely followed by the faithful gumpent row they were greeted by another volley but both escaped unhurt in another moment kerr and his marathas were among the rebels who knowing well the death that awaited them if conquered fought with the energy of despair one of their bullets cut the chain of kerr's helmet another struck his sword and for a moment he was almost blinded by a musket discharged close to his face yet he ran his sword through the body of the man who fired it so vigorous had been the thrust that kerr could not at once withdraw his weapon and while in this helpless condition he was struck on the head with the butt end of a musket he reeled and would have been stabbed by one of the rebels had not his indian namesake rushed forward and laid the sepoy low as the man fell kerr recovered and went dashing forward the mutineers driven to the last extremity now took refuge in a building which had formerly been used as a temple having barricaded the door they again opened fire on their assailants whose numbers were now reduced to seven the remaining ten having been either killed or wounded with this slender force kerr advanced to the door crowbar in hand this time however he failed to make an opening by its help but seeing some hay laying near he piled it against the door and set it on fire in a few moments the flames had done their work the door fell in and through flame and smoke kerr and his men dashed in upon the mutineers then followed a brief and terrible struggle mingled with the clang and clash of weapons the shouts of deadly hatred and the groans of the wounded not a single sepoy escaped all were either killed or taken prisoners the consequences of this victory cannot be estimated the officers at kolapore were saved the rising spirit of mutiny in the bombay presidency received a final check and it revived the confidence of both officers and men in each other of the gallant band that had accomplished so much eight were killed four afterwards died of their wounds and not one of them escaped unhurt great was the praise bestowed on lieutenant kerr for his dashing and devoted bravery and well did he merit the victoria cross which he received End of chapter ten chapter eleven of stories of the victoria cross by frank mundell this librivox recording is in the public domain lucknow cavanagh 
among those shut up in the residency at lucknow was a civilian named kavanagh he had passed his whole life in india and was perfectly acquainted with the language and customs of the hindus during the siege he had taken an active part in several sorties and had on every occasion greatly distinguished himself if danger in any form had to be encountered kavanagh was sure to offer his services when sir colin campbell was advancing to the relief of lucknow it was of the first importance that information should be conveyed to him concerning localities and other matters so that the force within and the army without might be able to act together sir james eltram and general havelock were quite at a loss in the matter for they knew no native who could be trusted with so important a mission for any one but a native to try to pass through the rebel forces and the hostile population meant detection and certain death kavanagh heard of the difficulty in which his chiefs were placed and at once volunteered sir james eltram at first refused to accept his offer saying that he thought the attempt so dangerous that he would not have asked any officer to go but there was no time to waste so at length sir james gave his consent thinking no doubt that if any one could succeed it was the gallant civilian accordingly at half past seven that night kavanagh appeared before his commander disguised as an irregular soldier of the city with a sword and shield his face down to the shoulders and his hands up to the wrists were coloured with lamp black his dress consisted of a yellow silk courtar over a tight-fitting white muslin shirt a yellow-coloured chintz sheet thrown round his shoulders a cream-coloured turban native-made shoes and a white waistband so complete was his disguise that his friends failed at first to recognise him having received his instructions he set out on his perilous mission accompanied by a native guide and proceeded to the right bank of the river gumty here he says we undressed and quietly forded the river which was only about four feet and a half deep and about a hundred yards wide at this point my courage failed me while in the water and if my guide had been within reach i should perhaps have pulled him back and abandoned the enterprise but he waded quickly through the stream and reaching the opposite bank went crouching up a ditch for three hundred yards to a grove of low trees on the edge of a pond where we stopped to dress my confidence now returned to me and with my tulwar resting on my shoulder we advanced into the huts in front where i accosted a matchlockman who answered to my remark that the night was cold it is very cold in fact it is a cold night i passed him adding that it would be colder by and by after going six or seven hundred yards farther we reached the iron bridge over the gumty where we were stopped and called over by a native officer my guide advanced to the light and i stayed a little back in the shade after being told that we had come from mundron our old cantonment and then in the possession of the enemy and that we were going into the city to our homes he let us proceed recrossing the gumty by the stone bridge we went by a sentry unobserved who was closely questioning a dirtily dressed native and into the principal street of the city of lucknow which was not illuminated as much as it used to be previous to the siege nor was it so crowded 
i jostled against several armed men in the street without being spoken to when issuing from the city into the country we were challenged by a watchman who without stopping us merely asked us who we were i was in great spirits when we reached the green fields into which i had not been for five months everything around us smelt sweet and a carrot i took from the roadside was the most delicious i had ever tasted a farther walk of a few miles was accomplished in high spirits but there was trouble before us we had taken the wrong road and were now quite out of our way in a park which was occupied by the enemy i went within twenty yards of two guns to see what strength they were and returned to the guide who was in great alarm and begged that i would not distrust him because of the mistake as it was caused by his anxiety to take me away from the pickets of the enemy i bade him not to be frightened of me as i was not annoyed as such accidents were not infrequent even when there was no danger to be avoided it was now about midnight we endeavoured to persuade a cultivator who was watching his crop to show us the way for a short distance but he urged old age and lameness another whom i commanded to come with us ran off screaming and alarmed the whole village we next walked quickly away into the canal in which i fell several times owing to my shoes being wet and slippery and my feet sore the shoes were hard and tight and had rubbed the skin off my toes and cut into the flesh above the heels in two hours more we were again on the right road two women in a village we passed having kindly helped us to find it about two o'clock we reached an advanced picket of sepoys who told us the way after asking us where we had come from and whither we were going i thought it safer to go up to the picket than to try and pass them unobserved the moon had risen by this time and we could see well ahead by three o'clock we arrived at a grove of mango trees in which a man was singing at the top of his voice i thought he was a villager but he got alarmed on seeing us approach and astonished us too by calling out a guard of twenty-five sepoys all of whom asked questions here the guide lost heart for the first time and threw away the letter entrusted to him for sir colin campbell i kept mine safe in my turban the guard seemed greatly relieved on finding it was not their terrible foe who was only a few miles in advance of them after walking for half an hour we got into a swamp we had to wade through it for two hours up to our waists in water and through weeds but before we found out that we were in a swamp we had gone too far to recede i was nearly exhausted on getting out of the water having made great exertions to force our way through the weeds and prevent the colour being washed off my face it was nearly gone from my hands i now rested fifteen minutes in spite of the remonstrances of the guide and then went forward passing between two pickets of the enemy who had no sentries thrown out it was near four o'clock in the morning when i stopped at the corner of a grove of trees to sleep for an hour which the guide entreated i would not do but i thought he overrated the danger and lying down i told him to see if there was any one in the grove who would tell him where we then were we had not gone far when i heard the english challenge who comes there with a native accent we had reached a british cavalry outpost my eyes filled with joyful tears 
and i shook the sikh officer in charge of the picket heartily by the hand the old soldier was as pleased as myself when he heard from whence i had come and he was good enough to send two of his men to conduct me to the camp of the advance guard one of the british officers met me on the way and took me into his tent where i got dry stockings and trousers i thanked god for having conducted me through this dangerous enterprise and the guide for the courage and intelligence with which he had conducted himself during this trying night when we were questioned he let me speak as little as possible he always had a ready answer and i feel that i am indebted to him in a great measure more than to myself for my escape kavanagh delivered his letter to sir colin campbell who considered his act one of the most daring feats ever attempted when the relieving army advanced against lucknow kavanagh was beside the commander all the time and his intimate knowledge of the country was of the greatest benefit when he once more returned to his friends he was warmly praised for his devotion and welcomed as a hero in undertaking this enterprise kavanagh was prompted by a high sense of duty believing that he could be of use to the commander-in-chief and he was also anxious to perform some service which would give him the honour of wearing the glorious victoria cross his ambition was gratified he received the coveted honour and was as a further reward appointed assistant commissioner in oud End of chapter eleven Chapter 12 of Stories of the Victoria Cross by Frank Mundell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Breaking the Square. In the early days of January 1857, an expedition consisting of two British and three native regiments under the command of Sir James Eltram left India for the Persian Gulf their object was to punish the persians for ill-treating british residents at the capital and for the repeated insults they had offered to the british flag about the end of the month the troops landed at the town of busher which they took almost without opposition after resting for a few days they started to march into the interior on the first two days the men suffered greatly from tempests of wind accompanied by clouds of fine dry dust which penetrated the ears eyes nostrils and mouths of the soldiers and seemed to force its way into the very pores of their skin these were followed by dreadful thunderstorms and rain fell in torrents as the troops were without shelter of any kind both officers and men were soon drenched to the skin these uncomfortable surroundings however could not daunt the ardour of a body of men under the command of such a leader as sir james eltram on the fifth of february the persian army was seen occupying a strong position and the british troops were at once drawn up in line and ordered to advance upon them the persians however did not wait for their opponents but speedily turned and fled leaving their camp and all their military stores in the hands of the invaders for two days the british were engaged in destroying the persian camp and in searching for buried treasure while so engaged the soldiers were constantly harassed by night alarms none of which however were caused by the enemy an amusing story is told of one of these night alarms it happened that a soldier in his shirt and trousers had wandered some distance from our camp during the night 
when an alarm rose that the enemy were upon us men scarcely awake rose to their feet rifle in hand and seeing a white object in the distance rushing towards them opened fire on it the more the unfortunate man sheltered for he was within the white object which was his shirt the more rapid was the firing at him until he came sufficiently near to be recognised fortunately the darkness of the night and the hurried way in which the men fired saved him from being hit on the evening of the seventh of february the troops set out to return to busher all went well until midnight when the persians attacked them in the rear though taken by surprise the soldiers behaved with perfect steadiness they received the charges of the enemy's horsemen with volley after volley then the persians retired and contented themselves with an occasional shot during the night when the day broke both armies prepared for battle the persians about eight thousand strong were drawn up near the village of kushab the british advanced to the attack under a heavy fire and soon silenced the hostile guns then our cavalry swept down upon the persian horsemen and by a brilliant charge scattered them like smoke in all directions they then made for the infantry but these warriors had witnessed the dispersion of their comrades and many of them did not wait to receive the charge with the exception of two battalions they turned and fled one of these battalions at once made ready for the approaching onset they formed square and prepared to receive cavalry those in the front rank knelt down on one knee and waited the charge with upraised bayonets those behind fired volley after volley with lightning rapidity there was no sign of fear on the faces of these men if they could not conquer they were prepared to die there are few instances in history of a square being broken by the heroic dash of one man perhaps you have read how on one occasion when the swiss were fighting for their liberty against the austrians arnold winkelried rushed upon the pikes of the enemy and with outstretched arms grasped ten of them together make way for liberty he cried made way for liberty and died his countrymen were not slow to take advantage of the gap thus made in the austrian ranks and in the end they won the victory we shall now see how lieutenant moore performed this rare feat at the battle of kushab mounted on a superb charger this gallant young officer rode furiously forward against the persian square leaving his comrades some distance behind when within a few yards of the front rank he put spurs to his horse and made it leap right on to the uprised bayonets of the enemy the gallant steed fell dead within the square but its work was successfully accomplished the formation was broken and the troopers rushed in through the gap for some minutes nothing was heard but the clang and clash of arms and the hoarse shouts of men engaged in deadly conflict then there arose the shrieks of the wounded and cries for mercy all was soon over a remnant of the battalion was flying wildly across the plains with the horsemen in close pursuit where was more all this time when the horse fell dead within the square he was crushed beneath it and his sword was broken after getting clear of the dead animal 
the lieutenant attempted to carve his way through the mass of the enemy with the stump of the sword that remained the sight of the man who had been the means of bringing about their defeat roused the persians and they rapidly closed round him escape was impossible and no man could hope for his life against such fearful odds just then lieutenant malcolmson saw the perilous position of his comrade setting spurs to his horse he cleaved his way to moore's side calling to him to seize hold of his stirrup malcolmson bravely dashed out of the crowd bringing his companion with him in safety neither of these two heroes were wounded moore received the victoria cross for his conspicuous gallantry in breaking the square the thoughtfulness for others cool determination devoted courage and ready activity shown by lieutenant malcolmson gained for him also the coveted decoration End of chapter 12chapter thirteen of stories of the victoria cross by frank mundell this librivox recording is in the public domain storming the taku forts in eighteen fifty eight a treaty was made between great britain and france on the one side and china on the other in which it was agreed that great britain should send a minister to reside in pekin and that british subjects should be allowed to travel in china one of the conditions of this agreement was that it should be ratified at pekin within a year the chinese strongly objected to the presence of foreigners in their sacred capital accordingly when the ambassadors arrived at the mouth of the river peiho they found their farther progress barred and on attempting to force a passage they were repulsed with a loss of many of their escort this brought about a war with china a land most remarkable for its quaint details its remoteness from all european sympathies so strangely exclusive and known to us only and vaguely as the celestial empire with the wonderful wall that girds it as the land of tea and opium of aladdin and the wonderful lamp in eighteen sixty a british expedition was dispatched to china under the command of sir james hope grant there our force was joined by the french troops and together the allies advanced to storm the taku forts the country over which the troops had to pass was in appearance anything but cheerful black mud and pools of brackish water everywhere met the eye the water in these pools was quite undrinkable not a well was to be found and the district was dotted by sand hills only useful for skirmishing riflemen in the marshy ground the men often sank up to their waists and could only extricate themselves after most exhausting efforts to help the soldiers in their advance against the forts it was resolved to make roads and the engineers at once set to work in spite of the almost incessant fire from the forts the roads were speedily completed and on the twentieth of august the soldiers heard with joy that the attack would be made on the following morning before dawn on the twenty first the troops advanced when day broke the chinese opened fire from all the forts our guns replied and soon the storm of war raged in all its fury a well-directed shot entered the enemy's magazine which exploded with terrific violence shaking the country round about for miles as if by an earthquake shock 
the guns in the fort were silenced shortly afterwards a storming party now advanced accompanied by a detachment of marines carrying a pontoon bridge for the passage of the wet ditches in front of the fort then the enemy opened a heavy fire from their rifles and the advance was continued under a shower of bullets the efforts of the marines to lay down the pontoon bridge were unsuccessful and after sixteen men had been wounded the attempt had to be abandoned the french storming party were more successful in crossing the ditches they employed a number of chinese coolies to carry scaling ladders and when these were found to be too short for their purpose the coolies gallantly jumped into the water and held the ladders on their shoulders till the french got across several of our soldiers took advantage of this human bridge but the greater number swam or waded to the other side on reaching the fort the french attempted to climb the walls but they encountered a most vigorous resistance and as fast as they reached the top they were slain or hurled back by the defenders the british however succeeded in effecting a breach large enough to admit one man at a time and through this small opening the soldiers rushed to the final capture meanwhile the british and french troops were eagerly striving for the honour of first planting a flag on the fort ensign chaplin who carried the colours of the sixty seventh regiment was foremost in this friendly rivalry after the explosion of the chinese magazine when the order to advance was given he rushed forward at the head of the regiment holding the standard proudly aloft before he had gone many yards he received a bullet in the arm down dropped the flag but only for a moment while chaplin hastily bound his handkerchief round the wound then he went after the regiment and once more took his place in the front though repeatedly urged by his comrades to go to the rear he refused and stuck to the colours determined that nothing but death should hinder him from planting the english flag first on the highest part of the fort in crossing the ditch chaplin met the french colour-bearer and playfully challenged that officer to enter the fort before him a terrible scene of confusion followed the repulse of the french storming party but throughout all the gallant ensign was eagerly on the watch for a chance to enter when at length the breach was made chaplin rushed in and clearing a path for himself hurried towards the goal of his ambition he allowed no one to impede his progress friends were pushed on one side and foes were stretched upon the ground a second wound more serious than the first caused him to stagger and one of the soldiers rushed forward to seize the colours chaplin only tightened his grasp on the flagstaff and turning a deaf ear to all warnings hurried on it was not likely that he who had dared so much was going to give in now that success was about to crown his efforts no indeed true the french were behind him but if he paused the chances were that their standard-bearer would rush in and win the race for glory so he struggled up to the highest point of the fort where he planted the english standard in triumph being the first to mount to the position chaplin had just succeeded in his self-imposed task when a shot from a chinese rifle struck him in the leg and he fell severely wounded though weak from loss of blood he held his ground till the regiment came up and saved him from falling into the hands of the enemy then the chinese garrison who had fought throughout with the most determined gallantry fled 
and the victory was won for his bravery on this occasion chaplin received the victoria cross end of chapter 13chapter 14 of stories of the victoria cross by frank mundell this librivox recording is in the public domain storming of the gate par british settlers had found their way to new zealand some years before these islands of the south pacific ocean became a british colony in eighteen forty a treaty was signed with the native chiefs by which the government of new zealand was vested in the crown but the native title to the soil was guaranteed since then every acre that has come into the possession of europeans has been duly paid for in eighteen sixty serious disputes arose between the british and the maoris as the natives of new zealand are called certain lands were sold without the consent of some of those who claimed proprietorship and these men took up arms to defend their ancient and hereditary rights at that time the british force in new zealand was very small but it was thought to be sufficient to overawe the natives under no circumstances was serious fighting expected the maoris however were determined to force their demands on the british and as they are a brave strong race of people and very warlike it was quite clear that they would not be put down without considerable trouble the maoris had a strong pa or fort at taranga where they made preparations to hold out against any force the british might bring against them the pa was built on the narrow neck of land which connects the peninsula of te papa with the coast and as the position is at the entrance to the whole region the fort was known as the gate pa the situation had been well chosen the swamps which stretched down to the beach on either side made it impossible for a body of troops to proceed inland without first storming the fort on the twenty eighth of april eighteen sixty four a force of infantry and a naval brigade of two hundred seamen from the different warships off the coast were mustered for an attack on the gate par the artillery opened fire and for several hours poured a deadly and unceasing torrent of shot and shell into the native position only by an occasional volley did the maoris give any indication of their presence within the fort and it was therefore thought that the majority of its defenders must be dead yet no attack was made until four o'clock in the afternoon when a breach was effected to admit a storming party commander hay of h m s harrier led the attack with ringing cheers the men rushed forward and in a few minutes they were inside the fortress for some time only an occasional shot was heard and the troops who had remained behind thought that the day was won suddenly the air was rent with savage cries volley after volley was heard within the pa and as the white smoke rose in the air captain hamilton fearing that something was wrong ordered the supports to advance before they could be put in motion a remnant of the storming party was seen rushing panic-stricken from the fort the supports hurried forward to the stockade but as captain hamilton was cheering on his men he fell dead the panic now became general and the advancing force joined the fugitives in their retreat nothing could stop them an uncontrollable fear had robbed them of their presence of mind and their very manhood 
discipline was powerless to recall them to a sense of their duty panic reigned supreme what was the cause of this terrible disaster when the stormers under hay entered the par they saw no trace of the foe except a few dying maoris lying on the ground thinking that the enemy had abandoned their position the soldiers laid down their rifles and began to wander carelessly about examining the construction of the par suddenly and silently from out of holes in the ground hitherto covered with branches and turf rose a host of maoris who immediately opened fire the british panic-stricken by the sudden and terrible apparition turned and fled leaving their wounded officers to the mercy of the foe there was however one man who that day conquered fear and by his gallantry gained for himself the cross of honour that was samuel mitchell of h m s harrier seeing commander hay who had been wounded at the first discharge lying helpless on the ground mitchell went to his assistance hay urged the gallant fellow to leave him where he was and secure his own safety but mitchell resolutely refused to stir a single step without his officer then raising the wounded man in his arms he carried him out of the par amid a shower of bullets when he got outside he met dr manley of the royal artillery to whom he handed over his charge on the spot the gallant surgeon bound up the commander's wounds and conveyed him to a place of safety he then returned to the par and heedless of the terrible fire which swept the fort he went in to attend to the wounded he moved about binding up their wounds and attending to the wants of the dying as calmly as if he had been at home he seemed to bear a charmed life for while he was so engaged the bullets of the enemy fell thick and fast on every side yet he was not even wounded for his unflinching heroism dr manley also received the victoria cross though a body of our soldiers were sent to cut off the enemy's retreat the maoris abandoned the fort and managed to make their escape during the night End of chapter fourteen Chapter Fifteen of Stories of the Victoria Cross by Frank Mundell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Saving the Colours. Seldom have the British arms suffered such a terrible reverse as that which happened at the Battle of Isandula, when an overwhelming force of Zulus attacked the camp, carried all before them and left not a single soldier alive on the field just before the zulus made their last rush colonel pullin seeing that the day was lost called lieutenant melville of the twenty fourth regiment to his side and told him to take the colours and ride for his life and not to rest until he had put them out of the reach of the enemy when the colonel had started melville he returned to the fight his last words to his soldiers were those of a brave man and a briton men we are here and here we must remain a few minutes afterwards the gallant officer and every man under his command had fallen before a wild rush of the zulus lieutenant melville took the colours and galloped off in the direction of the buffalo river the country through which he had to pass was very rugged his horse was worn out and worse than all a swift-footed company of zulus was in close pursuit for six miles they kept up with him and whenever the opportunity offered they opened fire <laughs> 
the lieutenant however did not lose heart but struggled manfully on and at length reached the river rider and horse plunged in and made for the opposite bank the noble animal seemed conscious of its master's need and exerted its utmost strength but it made little headway against the fiercely rushing current the colours got wet and hung about melville's body so as to seriously hamper his movements and when about midstream he was swept from the saddle on a rock at some distance away the lieutenant saw another soldier and shouted to him to seize the colours he obeyed but the force of the torrent was so great that he was dragged off the rock meanwhile lieutenant coghill of the same regiment who had been unable to take part in the battle owing to an injured knee had succeeded in reaching the river he urged his horse into the stream and was soon safe on the other side while resting to allow the animal to recover its wind his attention was arrested by the sight of a man struggling in the water some way lower down he recognised lieutenant melville at once and again plunged into the river to go to his assistance he had not proceeded far when his horse was shot by the zulus who now lined the bank in large numbers and he was also thrown into the water while the two officers were struggling with the current the colours were swept away and with difficulty they reached the opposite bank some days later their bodies were found about three hundred yards from the river in front of two enormous rocks they had made their final stand and a gallant stand it was the two comrades lay side by side pierced with many wounds and around them were the bodies of many large and powerful zulu warriors silent witnesses of the desperate fight melville and coghill had made for life their field of fame was their grave for they were buried together on the spot where they had fallen thus perished the last of the british officers killed in the battle of isandula some time afterwards the flag they had vainly tried to convey to a place of safety was found in the bend of the river when at the close of the war it was presented to the queen her majesty crowned it with a wreath of immortelles a gracious tribute of admiration for those who in that far-off land had laid down their lives in its defence never while the memory of the zulu war lasts can the unflinching patriotism of melville in attempting to save the colours and the self-sacrificing gallantry of coghill in returning to help his brother officer cease to be remembered the award of the victoria cross would have crowned their valour had not death thrust his dart before honour could place her chaplet on the same day that the events already narrated took place the buffalo river was the scene of another display of british heroism a mounted soldier named wassell who had escaped the massacre of isandula rode in hot haste from the camp pursued by a body of zulus hoping to reach natal he made the best of his way to the buffalo on reaching the river he saw a comrade struggling in the water and apparently drowning without a moment's hesitation he dismounted and plunged into the stream to the rescue after a hard struggle wassell succeeded in bringing the sinking man back to the spot where he had left his horse on the zulu side of the river remounting he plunged again into the stream with his almost exhausted companion and held him up until the opposite bank was gained all the while under a heavy fire from a few zulus who came up just as he plunged into the river for the second time 
for this brave deed wassell received the victoria cross end of chapter fifteen chapter sixteen of stories of the victoria cross by frank mundell this librivox recording is in the public domain the heroic defence of rourke's drift on the afternoon of the twenty second of january eighteen seventy nine while lieutenant chard was on duty at the buffalo river he was hailed by two men who shouted to be taken across he at once ferried them over and they told him in a few hurried and breathless sentences that an overwhelming force of zulus had massacred the british troops at isandula and were advancing on rourke's drift ordering the men under his command to return to the camp as soon as possible the lieutenant hurried on before them when he arrived he found that lieutenant bromhead was busily engaged in putting the place in a state of defence rourke's drift between isandula and natal had at one time been a mission station and contained a church and a small house the church was now used as a storehouse and the dwelling had been converted into a hospital to connect the two a rude wall of mealy bags was hastily thrown up and inside of this a second wall of biscuit boxes was made not a moment was there to lose and every man worked as if the lives of all depended upon his single exertions boxes of ammunition were brought out and placed within reach so that there should be no lack of powder and shot these preparations had hardly been completed when the sound of firing was heard and in a moment more five hundred zulus appeared the soldiers at once rushed to their positions and with loaded rifles and fixed bayonets silently awaited the attack on came the zulus confident of an easy victory but they were met with a volley which caused numbers of them to bite the dust this unexpected reception rather cooled their ardour and they took refuge in some low outhouses and field ovens from which they kept firing until the main body of their comrades came up they soon arrived a mighty force three thousand in number seeing that they could not take the place by surprise they lined the hill overlooking the camp and began to pour a terrific fire on the defenders then they made a rush at the wall of mealy bags and several desperate encounters followed the soldiers however stuck gallantly to their posts and wielded their bayonets to good purpose the zulus retired only to come on again with redoubled fury but they could not overcome the little band of heroes nor cause them to waver for an instant with no little anxiety did the two lieutenants watch the progress of the fight and their example was not wanting to nerve the men to deeds of devotion clearly above the din of battle rang out their orders and words of encouragement lieutenant chard left nothing undone that could aid them in their gallant defence lieutenant bromhead did great execution among the zulus with his rifle he seemed to see everything if at one part help was needed there he was among the men with bayonet fixed fighting like a common soldier if at another directions were required he was present to give them at length the fire from the hill became so hot that it was judged prudent to retire within the line of biscuit boxes accordingly lieutenant chard gave the order 
and the men abandoned the outer line by this movement the enemy were enabled to reach the hospital into which they made desperate efforts to force an entrance failing in this some of them climbed onto the roof and fired the thatch it now became necessary to remove the sick and wounded the doors were again assailed and while some of the soldiers helped the sick and wounded to a place of safety others stood with bayonets fixed to defend the entrance two privates named robert jones and william jones defended the room in which they were posted till six out of the seven patients were removed as fast as the enemy came up to the doorway they were struck down until the entrance was nearly filled with their dead bodies the seventh man refused to move and when robert jones returned to make another attempt to rescue him he found the poor fellow dead with a zulu spear sticking in his breast breaking through a partition they entered another room where they found privates hook and williams bravely contending against overwhelming odds hook and the two joneses took upon themselves the task of keeping the zulus at bay while williams helped the sick and wounded the terrible scene was now rendered perfectly appalling with the bloodthirsty yells of the zulus the cries of the sick that remained and the burning thatch falling about our heads the three soldiers fought on with undiminished bravery till twenty-three out of the twenty-six patients were rescued the whole of the hospital was now burning furiously and it was no longer possible to remain in it so the four heroes made their escape into the centre of the square the lurid light shed across the scene of battle by the flames of the burning buildings revealed an awful sight all around as far as the eye could reach nothing could be seen but a surging mass of zulus the outer line of defences as well as the hospital was in their possession and it was evident they were preparing for a final attempt to carry the position fresh ammunition was served out and the little band of heroes stood calm but determined awaiting the onset the zulus seeing that they could not break down the defence abandoned the attack and retired to a short distance from which they kept up a steady fire for some hours then it became gradually less frequent and finally ceased when a new day was shedding its welcome light across the sky the garrison strained their eyes to catch sight of the foe not one was to be seen favoured by the darkness they had retired in silence tired as they were with their tremendous exertions the soldiers began to strengthen their position in case of another attack about seven o'clock while they were busy removing the thatch from the roof of the storehouse a large body of the enemy came in sight the soldiers at once flew to arms and took up their positions the enemy slowly advanced for a short distance when they turned and disappeared shortly afterwards the welcome sight of redcoats gladdened the eyes of the garrison it was the british force under the command of lord chelmsford when he arrived upon the scene and heard the story of the conflict he turned to the men and said thank you all very much for your gallant defence gallant indeed it was a hundred and thirty-nine british soldiers behind a weak and irregular line of defence had repulsed the repeated attacks of upwards of three thousand zulus the british loss was fifteen killed while of the zulus 
three hundred and fifty were slain it is indeed the most heroic defence in our military annals lieutenants chard and bromhead together with six of their men received the victoria cross for their bravery on being asked what were his feelings during the desperate encounter in which he was engaged robert jones replied as to my feelings at the time they were that i was certain that if we did not kill them they would kill us my thought was only to fight as an english soldier ought to for his most gracious sovereign queen victoria and for the benefit of old england there can be little doubt that the words of this brave soldier express the idea that was uppermost in the mind of every man of that heroic little band End of chapter sixteen chapter seventeen of stories of the victoria cross by frank mundell this librivox recording is in the public domain storming of the inflobane mountain in march eighteen seventy nine colonel evelyn wood who was in command of the british camp at cambula hill decided to attack the zulu stronghold situated upon the inflobane mountain he had heard that the enemy meditated an attack on the british position and being desirous of finding out their strength and the probable direction of their attack he sent forward colonel redvers buller with a force of colonials and natives to gain the desired information before daylight on the twenty eighth the climb up the steep side of the mountain was commenced as the light became stronger and the rising wind drove away the mist the toiling soldiers could see a number of zulus taking up their positions round some stone forts upon the summit presently the foremost of the troops halted to take breath and to allow the remainder of the force to come up then with a loud cheer all rushed forward towards the heights a short sharp struggle followed the zulus were put to flight and the stronghold was won the top of the mountain was a broad plateau about five miles long and broken up in many places by immense hollows there were also a countless number of caves and in some of these the defeated zulus took refuge buller and his men at once set to work to drive them out and though the enemy offered a stubborn resistance they were compelled to seek safety elsewhere the soldiers then returned to the place where they had ascended and discovered to their dismay that the zulus had received reinforcements from the mountain sides and were preparing for an attack in overwhelming numbers at the same time another company of zulus was seen advancing at a run from the opposite direction to cut off their retreat it was now necessary to return and buller accordingly gave the order down the precipitous path the troops retired exposed to the almost incessant firing of the zulus massed above them some idea of the perilous nature of the descent may be formed from the fact that the soldiers had to jump across openings three or even four feet wide many of the mounted men had their horses shot under them as the enemy pressed upon the rear of the little force but for buller's heroic exertions there is little doubt that the troops would have been massacred by voice and action he cheered and encouraged his men though he had been in the saddle for forty-eight hours and had received a painful wound he covered their retreat in person again and again he charged the foe 
so as to allow his followers time to get clear of the fearful maze of rocks many gallant actions were performed during that retreat but those of redvers buller shine forth like a planet among the lesser stars six lives he is known to have saved personally and how many more by his orders and example it would be difficult to tell captain darcy had his horse shot under him and was forced to retire on foot being an officer and at the rear of the force he was a special object of mark for the dusky warriors and he was in great danger of falling into their hands when buller came up taking in the captain's danger at a glance he reined in his horse assisted him to mount and carried him to the main body lieutenant everett who had been dismounted by the same cause had also to thank his commander for his life a trooper of the frontier light horse whose charger was brought to a standstill completely exhausted would have been instantly slain by the zulus but for the timely arrival of colonel buller who carried him in a similar manner to a place of safety for these three gallant rescues colonel buller received the victoria cross another soldier who distinguished himself by his humanity and daring on this occasion was lieutenant brown of the twenty fourth regiment the mounted infantry were being closely pressed by the zulus when one of the troopers was thrown from his horse and was in momentary danger of being overtaken and killed by the swift-footed enemy seeing the peril lieutenant brown galloped back to the man's assistance under a heavy fire and assisted him to remount later in the day he performed a similar action with equal success but for the lieutenant's prompt action both of these men would have lost their lives for his gallant conduct brown received the highly prized decoration End of chapter 17chapter 18 of stories of the victoria cross by frank mundell this librivox recording is in the public domain the attack on morosi's mountain while the zulu war was taxing the energies of great britain fresh troubles broke out in another part of south africa the basutos a bold hardy tribe who inhabited the country on the western side of the colony of natal took up arms to defend their land against an expected invasion of the british on being ordered by the high commissioner to surrender their arms they refused and broke out into open rebellion a force of colonists and friendly natives marched against the basuto chief named morosi two engagements took place in both of which the british force was victorious and succeeded in carrying off many horses and a large number of cattle finding that they were no match for the invaders in open conflict the basutos retired to their most impregnable fortress known as morosi's mountain here they made preparations for a stubborn resistance the british colonial troops were sent against this mountain with all speed but on arrival they found that their task of capturing it was by no means easy on three sides the mountain was perfectly perpendicular while the fourth was a steep slope of about a mile in length this slope was protected by a series of walls from eight to twelve feet high loopholed for rifles and guns and very strongly built the troops advanced to the attack 
but from behind the stockade the basutos poured a heavy fire upon their assailants and they had to abandon the attempt after repeated failures to carry the stronghold it was resolved to starve the defenders into submission the mountain was accordingly surrounded by the british force who kept a sharp watch that no provisions were conveyed to the besieged the basutos however refused to surrender a final assault was at length made this time with complete success the fortress was captured and among others the chief morosi was shot after this the basutos laid down their arms and submitted to british authority the victory was not gained without the shedding of blood and two men won the victoria cross from behind a line of stone barricades the basutos brought a heavy fire to bear on the colonial troops toiling up the steep ascent owing to the secure position of the enemy it was impossible for the troops to return the fire and they were shot down in large numbers seeing this sergeant scott of the cape mounted rifles volunteered to throw few shells over this barricade and dislodge the enemy his offer was accepted after giving orders for the men of his party to retire lest the shell should burst scott boldly advanced under a heavy fire on getting beneath the shelter of the wall he made two attempts to throw shells over it at the second attempt owing to some defect in the fuse the shell burst the moment it left his hands scott suffered severely by the explosion receiving a wound in his right leg and having his right hand blown to pieces but for his forethought in ordering his party to retire under cover great loss of life would probably have been the result of the accident during the attack surgeon hartley distinguished himself by gallantry as humane as it was conspicuous seeing corporal jones of the cape mounted rifles lying wounded and unable to move the surgeon went out to his assistance proceeding into the open under heavy fire he reached the wounded man raised him in his arms and brought him back to the british lines strange to say he escaped unhurt but the corporal received a second wound while being conveyed to a place of safety surgeon hartley noticed on his way many others of the attacking force lying helpless so after he had attended to the corporal's injuries he returned to dress the wounds of these men heedless of the bullets that whistled round him some months later war broke out again in basutoland and another army medical officer won the coveted honour the basutos displayed the most determined bravery and forced the british to retire with considerable loss in killed and wounded then surgeon mccrae went out for a considerable distance in front under a heavy fire and brought one of the wounded men to a sheltered position while on his way for a stretcher he was severely wounded by a bullet in his right breast in spite of this he continued to assist the wounded bringing them in and attending to them till the close of the day as there was no other surgeon on the field mccrae had to dress his own wound the self-devotion of his conduct on this occasion called forth the admiration of his commanding officer who wrote had it not been for this gallantry and devotion to his duty on the part of surgeon mccrae the sufferings of the wounded men would undoubtedly have been much aggravated and greater loss of life would probably have occurred <laughs>
End of chapter 18chapter nineteen of stories of the victoria cross by frank mundell this librivox recording is in the public domain a desperate encounter in the month of march eighteen seventy nine captain leach of the royal engineers was out on survey duty in the country near maidenac in afghanistan accompanied by an escort of sikhs under lieutenant barclay he had almost completed his work when he noticed a number of afghans hovering about the flanks and rear of his small force he knew only too well that the enemy were endeavouring to mass their forces behind him and cut off his retreat he also knew that their numbers must be vastly superior to his own so he ordered his men to retire this was the signal for the afghans to appear from behind their cover and open fire before the escort had time to reply they had disappeared a few were now seen advancing from cover to cover firing their rifles as they approached two of the escort were hit and slightly wounded lieutenant barclay thought that it was now time to show his teeth he therefore led half of the sikhs back for a short distance and ordered them to fire but not to waste a single shot the men obeyed his commands to the letter and several afghans were seen to fall but as their numbers increased so did their boldness and heedless of their losses they approached nearer as the lieutenant stood directing the fire of his men he suddenly staggered and fell with a ball in his chest captain leach immediately rushed forward with the remainder of the sikhs to stem the expected rush carefully and tenderly several of his men lifted the wounded lieutenant and bore him quickly backwards followed by the remainder of the escort under captain leach the afghans evidently thought that the moment had arrived for them to strike a final blow for victory they massed their forces and rushed down upon the retreating sikhs confident of an easy triumph captain leach saw them coming and prepared for their reception fix bayonets was the first order this was no sooner done than he called out charge follow me and dashed straight at the enemy closely followed by his gallant sikhs confident in the strength of their numbers the afghans received the charge in splendid style firing their rifles with great precision though almost surrounded the sikhs behaved with perfect steadiness and wielded their bayonets with great effect many of the enemy fell but their places were quickly taken by fresh men the fight was indeed desperate leach was attacked by four afghans at once raising his revolver he fired and brought down the foremost assailant the second shared a similar fate the third man threw himself upon the officer with impetuous fury hoping to be able to get to close quarters leach raised his trusty weapon once more and fired his last shot with unerring aim and fatal effect meanwhile the fourth man had seized the opportunity and slipped round behind just as he was in the act of plunging his long afghan knife into the captain's back he fortunately turned round seeing the blade about to descend he put up his left arm to ward off the blow the movement saved his life but he received a deep cut in the arm the next instant the assailant lay helpless on the ground still the battle raged 
at every blow an afghan fell yet their numbers seemed as great as ever the strain of the unequal contest was beginning to tell upon the escort so leech decided to bring it to a speedy end one way or another with a loud cheer he again dashed at the foe followed by his gallant men this was not what the afghans expected and after a short sharp struggle they wavered broke and fled the retreat was resumed and as the escort made its way along the rugged road the enemy again opened fire from behind the shelter of rocks and trees after a time the brave captain saw that they were preparing for another attack so without a moment's delay he put himself at the head of the sikhs and charged the afghans however did not wait for him but made off at once as the little band reached the open country the enemy gave them a parting volley just then a troop of cavalry came up and relieved the escort from further attack when the camp was reached it was found that lieutenant barclay's wound was mortal he died shortly afterwards captain leach received the victoria cross for his prompt and heroic conduct by which he saved the whole of the escort from total destruction End of chapter 19chapter twenty of stories of the victoria cross by frank mundell this librivox recording is in the public domain lieutenant hamilton's bravery in northern afghanistan between kabul and jalalabad stands the town of futterbad here was stationed in eighteen seventy nine a british force under brigadier general goff a dashing but prudent commander whose duty it was to keep clear the line of communication from jalalabad to the afghan capital this work required the utmost vigilance for the whole of the surrounding country was infested with hostile tribes eager and ready to destroy the little army which had been set down in their midst the commander however was equal to the task and his arrangements were so perfect that he could be instantly informed of any movement of the enemy on the second of april eighteen seventy nine word was brought to the camp that a large body of afghans was mustering near the fortified village of karja goff at once prepared to march out to the attack before the troops had started two scouts came galloping in to say that the enemy were beginning to fortify themselves on some high ground overlooking the road and that unless they were instantly attacked great difficulty would be found in dislodging them the brigadier gave his orders and artillery infantry and cavalry went forward on coming in sight of the enemy he found that they were indeed strongly posted and he could see about five thousand men hurrying to and fro behind the rough defences which they had erected though his own force numbered only twelve hundred men he felt sure of victory the artillery and the infantry opened fire and the cavalry stood together impatiently waiting the moment when their work would begin then goff executed a brilliant manoeuvre to lure the enemy from their stronghold he ordered his force to retreat out came the afghans with fierce yells to annihilate as they thought the retreating soldiers suddenly at a given signal the troops faced right about and poured a deadly volley into the afghan ranks and with a loud hurrah charged though taken by surprise the fierce tribesmen made a desperate resistance till their standard was captured 
then they wavered seeing this the brigadier sent orders to the cavalry to charge down thundered the corps of guides commanded by major batty and dashed into the wavering mass their swords flashing in the sun in the charge two shots lodged in the thigh of their gallant leader but he rode on a third shot penetrated to his heart and he sank lifeless upon the ground when his men saw him fall a terrible cry of grief and rage broke from them and they pressed furiously forward led by lieutenant hamilton a number of the enemy prepared to meet the coming onset they raised their rifles and fired down fell the horse ridden by the sawar next to hamilton and as the animal fell it dragged down its rider whose leg had become entangled in the bridle seeing one of their foes thus at their mercy several afghans ran forward determined to put him to death just then the lieutenant missed the man from his side and on turning round to see what had become of him he saw an afghan with raised sword about to give the prostrate sawar his death blow he immediately turned his charger and galloped back to the rescue cutting and thrusting he made his way to the side of the fallen sawar and assisted him to disengage himself from the dead horse but his bravery nearly cost him his life an afghan raised his gun and was about to fire when another of the guides came up and knocked the weapon out of the man's grasp thus saving his officer's life again and again did hamilton and his guides charge the enemy now in full retreat and in less than half an hour they were totally dispersed and incapable of further resistance for his gallant conduct on this occasion and for saving the life of the sawar lieutenant hamilton was recommended for the victoria cross but it was not awarded though this must have been a great disappointment to the brave lieutenant it did not influence his courage and he fought with his usual dash throughout the remainder of the war till at length he fell at Kabul, pierced to death with the blows of an overpowering enemy then strange to say he was awarded the honour that was his due in july eighteen seventy nine sir louis cavanari went to Kabul as the british resident and an escort of guides accompanied him all went well for about two months when early one september morning a body of mutineers surrounded the residency and with loud shouts proclaimed their intention of murdering the british envoy the escort climbed on to the roof of the building and opened fire on the rebels who then retired in a short time however they returned and poured forth a regular torrent of musketry from the tops and windows of the surrounding houses those on the roof of the residency bravely replied and busied themselves in erecting a rude shelter to protect them from the murderous fire all day the fighting went on and as each hour passed the throng of afghans became thicker and thicker lieutenant hamilton behaved with the most splendid bravery animating all by his cheering words and dauntless bearing about three o'clock in the afternoon the rebels had succeeded in making their way to the top of the building and setting it on fire driven down by sheer weight of numbers the gallant defenders fought with the fury of despair as they were compelled to retreat from room to room contesting every inch of ground they left behind them many evidences of their prowess at length the courtyard was reached and here lieutenant hamilton and his little band of heroes made ready for a final stand 
the gates were quickly burst open and in poured the savage throng with a defiant cheer hamilton led his followers forward to try and cut their way through the enemy closed round them every time that the lieutenant's sword descended an afghan fell and by the might of his terrible arm he quickly cleared a space round him then the afghans evidently decided to sacrifice a few of their number to dispatch him speedily several of them advanced with his pistol he brought down the leader but the next instant the rest were upon him and after a short brave struggle the gallant hamilton yielded up his life and those with him also perished when the news of his death and the heroic manner of his dying reached england people ceased to think of the terrible disaster that had befallen the envoy and spoke only of the splendid bravery of lieutenant hamilton though he was dead the coveted and well-deserved honour of the victoria cross was awarded it had indeed been twice won and his friends had the satisfaction that his dauntless courage was at length publicly recognised End of chapter 20chapter twenty one of stories of the victoria cross by frank mundell this librivox recording is in the public domain the battle of my wand in july eighteen eighty a british force under general burrows was posted in a strongly fortified camp about forty miles from kandahar the general's orders were to watch the movements of the afghan army and prevent it from taking up any position from which it could proceed against kabul for several days all went well then on the twenty sixth word was brought to the camp that a large force of afghans was on its way to occupy maiwand a village some miles distant as it seemed to be the enemy's intention to pass the british without coming to close quarters the general decided to abandon the camp and intercept them on their march accordingly next morning the british army of about three thousand men set out and after about ten miles of the road had been covered a small troop of afghan horsemen suddenly appeared in sight followed by large masses of infantry and artillery though the enemy's force far outnumbered that under general burrows he continued his advance and ordered his men to make for a small village on the right it was found to be uninhabited and the troops were quickly drawn up in line on some rising ground near the soldiers stood as calmly as if on parade but every man knew that there was some terrible fighting in store for right in front the whole afghan army numbering at least twenty thousand men was getting ready for a determined attack before the enemy had completed their preparations our artillery opened fire upon them but they did not reply till they had got their own guns into such a position as to completely overlook the whole british force then they opened a terrific fire upon the soldiers who owing to the exposed nature of the ground they occupied fell in great numbers to prevent them from being speedily annihilated they were ordered to lie down flat on the ground and there they remained for three hours exposed to the full fury of the afghan cannonade then the enemy having completed all their preparations advanced at a rapid rate their appearance was enough to cause the bravest to tremble as with loud shouts 
they bore down upon the small force that resolutely awaited their onset resistance was of little or no avail against such odds and the awful fury of their attack panic-stricken our native infantry broke and fled leaving the sixty six regiment alone to bear the brunt of the battle they fought like heroes till overwhelmed by numbers they were forced to give way as they went slowly back in good order they stopped every now and again to send death through the serried ranks of their fierce pursuers and many fell under the thrusts of their bayonets but all their valour was in vain the foe by repeated rushes gradually broke up the greater part of the regiment into small parties which they surrounded and cut down later in the day about a hundred officers and men of the gallant sixty six made a final stand in a small village at some distance from the fatal field as the afghans surrounded them they fired deliberately and with steady aim every shot told the enemy replied with equal precision and man after man fell till there were only ten soldiers and one officer left with a loud shout they rushed on the foe to try and cut their way through but no opening was visible then these eleven heroes stood back to back and again began firing one by one they fell till only one man remained unyielding stern and resolute a bullet entered his chest and with one last look round he dropped on the heap of slain never to rise again history does not afford a grander or finer instance of gallantry and devotion to queen and country than that displayed by the sixty sixth regiment on the twenty seventh of july eighteen eighty meanwhile the wretched fugitives were making the best of their way to kandahar closely pursued by the victorious afghans cutting down all who were no longer able to defend themselves during that disastrous retreat the men of the royal horse artillery did yeoman service again and again did they turn and face the enemy who did not dare to come too near the deadly fire of the guns but for the bravery of this corps not a single man of burroughs's army would have lived to reach kandahar many deeds of devotion were performed on this occasion but only two men lived to receive the reward of their valour after one of the halts made by the artillery to check the pursuit sergeant mullane saw one of the drivers fall from his horse severely wounded the gun moved on but seeing that the man still lived mullane determined to go back and save him from falling a victim to the barbarous cruelties of the enemy following up his determination the gallant sergeant ran back in face of the afghans lifted the driver in his strong arms and bore him out of danger in the performance of this heroic act mullane had a very narrow escape for the afghans were only a few yards off when he reached the wounded driver a second time did sergeant mullane establish a claim to the victoria cross as our weary troops made their way to kandahar they were tormented with the most dreadful thirst many of the wounded died for want of water to moisten their parched throats and even strong men fell down exhausted the inhabitants of the villages through which they passed turned out in force and cut off any stragglers who had been tempted to leave the ranks to quench their thirst at length the cries of the wounded became unbearable 
and sergeant mullane volunteered to go into a neighbouring village to obtain the precious liquid he knew that a large number of his comrades had given their lives for a drop of water in that very village but the knowledge did not hinder him from making the attempt though fired on at every step he went and returned in safety bringing with him a plentiful supply during that awful retreat the victoria cross was also won by gunner james collis as he walked along by the side of his gun for his place was occupied by wounded men a party of the enemy stopped the horses and from either side opened a crossfire on the gun and its helpless load unless their fire could be attracted in some other direction the lives of the wounded would be sacrificed and the gun would certainly fall into the enemy's hands rushing to the front collis began firing thus drawing the attention of the afghans upon himself for several minutes he maintained his perilous position till the gun was taken out of range of the hostile fire though bullets fell thick and fast around him he escaped without a wound and managed to reach his gun on another occasion while engaged in fetching water for the wounded from a village he observed a number of the enemy's cavalry approaching wishing to draw their attention from the wounded he opened fire on them with his rifle owing to the uneven nature of the ground the cavalry did not know that the fire which was emptying many of their saddles proceeded from one rifle and thinking that there must be a large force behind them they made off with all speed when collis returned to his gun the general in command of the cavalry went up to him and said you're a gallant young fellow what is your name on being told he entered it in a pocket-book and rode off throughout the retreat he behaved with the most undaunted courage and showed the utmost care and consideration for the wounded in the middle of the following month a sortie was made from kandahar when the plucky gunner again distinguished himself while the fighting was going on in a village about two hundred yards from the fort collis heard several of the officers talking about sending a message to the general in command the brave gunner at once stepped forward and volunteered to take the message over the wall after some hesitation general primrose gave him a note and he was lowered by means of a rope to the bottom of the ditch a distance of thirty or forty feet when halfway down the enemy opened fire on the gallant fellow but he escaped without injury scrambling out of the ditch he ran across to the village delivered his note and returned when halfway up the rope he was again fired upon and a bullet this time cut off the heel of one of his boots when he was once more in safety his commander warmly congratulated him and praises for his unselfish bravery were showered upon him from every side End of chapter twenty one chapter twenty two of stories of the victoria cross by frank mundell this librivox recording is in the public domain the battle of el teb in eighteen eighty three an arab revolt headed by a chief who called himself the madi or messiah broke out in the sudan a wide territory which lies to the south of egypt the rebellion spread with great rapidity among the fierce tribesmen of the east who flocked in large numbers to the standard of this false prophet 
they besieged the garrisons at tokar and sinkat two places near swakim a port on the red sea and in february eighteen eighty four a british force was sent to their rescue it is a remarkable fact that many of our most famous victories have been won in lands where the nature of the country and the climate have been alike unfavourable to success the snow-covered heights of the crimea the burning plains of india and the fiery sands of the sudan all bear witness to the heroic endurance and courage of the british soldier the march to the relief of the two garrisons was very trying to the troops the ground over which they had to pass was loose sandy soil water was scarce and many of the men suffered much from thirst yet these hardships were cheerfully borne and when at length the foe was seen the troops were ready and eager for the fray the order of advance was in the form of a large hollow square guarded on the outside by the cavalry while inside the baggage animals were placed on the twenty ninth of february the force came in sight of the village of el teb where the arabs had collected in large numbers to hinder the further progress of the british earthworks had been thrown up and mounted with a few guns and other warlike preparations had been made about eleven o'clock in the forenoon the enemy opened fire on the advancing troops the naval brigade with a few well-directed volleys from their machine guns soon silenced those of the enemy the fire from their rifles however continued and many of our men were wounded the square continued to steadily advance one writer said it is not a charge but a steady solid movement in the formation which has all along been observed it looks however all the more formidable for enthusiasm and discipline are equally marked as the whole of the troops are cheering while the square sweeps down towards the enemy as the troops approach nearer the enemy's position the firing ceased and these sons of the desert came forth to show their reckless bravery and disregard for life in the face of an enemy in small bodies of twenty or thirty they charged uttering fierce cries and brandishing their spears on they came heedless of the deadly fire that swept them down like grass before the mower's scythe that side of the square against which their attack was principally directed was formed by the naval brigade and two other regiments the sailors were quite as cool as the soldiers and kept up the deadly fusillade with great spirit conscious of their superior numbers the arabs pressed on till they came within reach of our bayonets the firing they had braved but that grim push of cold steel was too much for them they turned and fled in this last short sharp struggle captain wilson of the naval brigade gained the victoria cross for one of the most courageous acts ever witnessed a slight gap had been made in the square and a number of arabs noticing the opening rushed forward to break through captain wilson saw the danger to which the whole force was thus exposed and boldly advanced to meet them seeing one of his men about to be speared by an arab he went to his assistance and ran the rebel through the body with his sword the force of the thrust however had been too great and the blade broke off near the hilt to all appearances captain wilson was now a doomed man alone and defenceless among the arabs 
but they soon discovered that an Englishman is not defenceless while his two hands remain. With splendid courage, Wilson faced his assailants, and as one after the other came within reach of his powerful arms, he felled the black warriors to the ground with his fists. Thus did the gallant captain hold the foe at bay till the troops came up and finally dispersed them. Wonderful to relate, he came out of this encounter with only a few slight wounds, and there can be little doubt that he owed his safety in no small degree to the surprising nature of his attack. When the Arabs fled, the cavalry under Brigadier General Stuart went out to complete the victory. The horsemen charged with their usual dash, but much confusion was caused in their ranks by the rebels, who, at the risk of being trampled under the horse's hooves, lay down and stabbed the animals as they passed. In this way, Colonel Barrow of the 19th Hussars and many troopers were unhorsed and severely wounded. Seeing his colonel lying helpless on the ground, Sergeant Marshall performed an act of splendid daring. He seized a riderless horse, and, in spite of the heavy fire of the retreating Arabs, brought it up to his officer, and helped him to mount. After escorting the wounded colonel to a place of safety, Marshall again threw himself into the thick of the fight, where he displayed the same calm bravery. His gallant deed won for him the coveted honour of the Victoria Cross. End of chapter 22Chapter 23 of Stories of the Victoria Cross by Frank Mundell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Battle of Abu Kli. Early in 1885, the Mahdi and his followers besieged General Gordon in Khartoum, a town at the junction of the White Nile and the Blue Nile. To relieve the garrison, a force of 1,500 men under Sir Herbert Stuart was ordered to march across the Bayuda Desert. Some idea of the perilous nature of the undertaking may be had from the fact that when this flying column, as it was called, left Corti, the natives declared that it would never be heard of again. The difficulties of the march were well known to the general, but he felt sure that all obstacles could be overcome by the courage and endurance of his men. There were wells along the line of march, so that he had little fear of the troops perishing of thirst. At length all were ready to start. Each man's water bottle was filled, and with a final warning to use the precious liquid sparingly, the column set out. What the troops endured on that march will never be written, for no language can describe their terrible sufferings. Heedless of the last warning their officers gave them before starting, many of the men drank freely of their little store of water thinking that a fresh supply would soon be obtained. But the wells along the line of march were dried up, the Arabs having destroyed the springs, and so the men had to toil on, half mad with thirst. At length, after a march of eighty miles, water was reached, but such water in any other place and under any other circumstances not one of the men would have given it to a dog but then it was a treasure of priceless worth the orders were that the fighting men were to be supplied first and held back at the point of the bayonet the wretched camp followers camel drivers and others frantically tore up the warm sand with their hands in the hope 
that a little water might collect therein and when it did so they stooped and lapped it up like thirsty dogs the troops profited by the lesson thus learned and were more careful in future after a trying march of nearly two hundred miles the column approached the wells at habu clee and were disappointed to learn that the enemy held them in great force it was then evening and so the wearied and thirsty soldiers had to wait till daybreak and victory should enable them to quench their burning thirst there was little sleep for the british that night for the enemy kept up a continuous fire and thrice the men were called to arms as an attack was expected the arabs had chosen their battleground well what seemed likelier to happen than that the soldiers wearied with excessive marches tropical heat parching thirst and repeated disappointments would fall an easy prey to their superior numbers breakfast was served early next morning and shortly afterwards the rebels opened fire then the column formed a hollow square and advanced to seize the wells our progress was like that of some huge machine slow regular and compact despite the hail of bullets pouring in from front right and left and ultimately from the rear altogether there were perhaps from ten to twelve thousand arabs gathered to oppose us they swarmed upon our front and for two or three miles on either side groups of their horsemen and spearmen could be seen watching us from the rocky peaks there was no avenue of retreat it was now to do or die the enemy made repeated charges with even greater fury than they displayed at el teb but they were unable to break through the line of glistening bayonets then they gathered together for a final onset with uplifted swords and spears ready poised they swept down on a corner of the square like a tempest and by sheer weight of numbers succeeded in breaking through then for a few minutes there was a scene of terrible confusion colonel burnaby of the guards was wounded in the throat by a spear thrust and knocked out of the saddle as he tumbled to the ground six arabs sprang upon him with the blood rushing in streams from his gashed throat the famous guardsman leapt to his feet and slashed at the ferocious group with all the might of his enormous strength they were the wild strokes of a proud brave man dying hard and he was quickly overborne and left helpless and dying it was an awful scene death and havoc reigned supreme general stuart's horse was shot under him and he narrowly escaped death from the arab spears many of the wounded lying helpless in the litters were stabbed to death by the merciless foe who rent the air with hoarse yells as they rushed about thirsting for blood even the beasts of burden did not escape their murderous fury for a time the fate of the whole expedition trembled in the balance but in the end discipline prevailed the soldiers rallied and after desperate exertions once more formed the square the enemy sullenly retired leaving the ground strewn with their dead their weapons and their banners fifteen minutes after the breaking of the square not a single living arab was to be seen standing within range of our rifles the soldiers cheered and cheered till they were hoarse over their dearly won victory during the hand-to-hand -hand struggle lieutenant guthrie of the royal artillery was struck to the ground badly wounded 
over him bent a dusky warrior about to plunge his spear into his breast a second more and the blow would fall suddenly the arab threw up his arms and fell lifeless gunner smith had observed his officer's peril and seizing a handspike from his gun he rushed out just in time to save him from the arab's spear though the enemy swarmed on every side the gallant gunner kept his post over the body of his officer till the square was reformed and help arrived guthrie's wounds proved fatal but gunner smith lived to receive and wear the victoria cross End of chapter 23chapter 24 of stories of the victoria cross by frank mundell this librivox recording is in the public domain the hero of manipur in the hill country between india and burma lies the small semi-independent state of manipur governed by a maharaja subject to the control of a british resident in the autumn of 1890, the Senapati, or commander-in-chief, dissatisfied with these arrangements, deposed his sovereign and placed one of his own friends on the throne. Though the native states are allowed considerable freedom in the management of their internal affairs, this act of rebellion called for the interference of the Indian government having decided on the banishment of the senapati mr quinton chief commissioner of assam visited the capital accompanied by a bodyguard of gorkas in march eighteen ninety one on his arrival at the residency the commissioner invited the senapati to a meeting and arranged for his arrest the native chief however suspected the trap and excused his attendance on the ground of illness it was then resolved to seize him in his palace this was scarcely a wise step to take under the circumstances the senapati had under his command eight thousand men with four pieces of artillery while the british force was only four hundred and fifty gorkas without a single cannon unmindful however of the disparity of numbers the palace was attacked and entered but the senapati had escaped the fighting went on all day but the british force had to retire from the palace from want of ammunition they fell back on the residency which they held for several hours under a heavy fire from the enemy having only a few rounds of ammunition left and no fresh supply being obtainable quinton decided that further resistance was hopeless he therefore determined to treat with the senapati that evening the chief commissioner frank grimwood the resident the colonel and several officers went to the palace about half past eight what actually passed at this interview we do not know excepting that the british were asked to surrender unconditionally this they refused to do and were at once cut down the residency now deprived of its chief officers was shortly afterwards again attacked by shot and shell knowing that their leaders would have returned if they had not met with some disaster the remaining officers decided to attempt to make their way to the nearest british outposts a distance of several miles carrying with them mrs grimwood the wife of the resident and sixteen wounded men mrs grimwood in a letter home thus describes the events which followed suddenly to my horror the firing began again at first i thought they had killed frank and the others 
but a bugler came rushing in and told us they had taken them prisoners as they would not listen to the shameful terms proposed which were that we were to give up our arms i fled down to the cellar again where the wounded were the firing was something awful and the shells bursting in every direction i got hurt in my arm it bled a lot but was not serious after another two hours we decided we must retreat as the house was in danger of catching fire the wounded were got out as quickly as possible three had died meanwhile we then moved off i dodged two shells by running behind a tree we went out at the back of the house and had to cross first a hedge of thorns then a high mud wall then a river before we could reach the road i had not even a hat and only very thin house shoes on one of these dropped off in the river where i got wet up to the shoulders we were fired at all the way i lay down in a ditch about twenty times that night while they were firing to try and escape bullets we left the residency at two o'clock in the morning and marched all the next day and the next night we had to go through the jungles as they were lying in wait for us all over the place and marched at least thirty miles with no food that was the twenty fifth on the morning of the twenty sixth we struck the Kachar road hoping to meet two hundred men who we knew were on their way up to relieve the guard we had eaten nothing since the morning of the twenty fourth except a few mouthfuls of so-called dinner snatched as best we could we had to eat grass and leaves but i was too done up to care much my feet were cut to bits and my arm would not stop bleeding and i was perished with cold having got so wet in crossing the river we went on down the road and came upon a stockade where there were crowds of the enemy this we had to rush and i sprained my ankle and gave myself up for lost but i got over somehow and then we saw some men running up the hill below us some said they were manapuris and some said gurkhas and for some time we did not know but for the first time fortune favoured us they turned out to be men from kachar and we were saved but not one moment too soon we had still eight days march before us to get to british territory but though we have been fired on all the way it has been an easy time compared with all we went through before and yesterday we reached british territory and i took off my clothes for the first time in ten days when the british outposts were reached the little force had only two cartridges left one of which had been reserved to save mrs grimwood from falling alive into the hands of the enemy for her heroic conduct and her care for the wounded under fire mrs grimwood received the order of the red cross meanwhile information of the trouble at manipur arrived at tamu a village some distance to the south but the terrible fate of the officers was not known hoping to arrive in time to save the prisoners a young officer named lieutenant grant collected a small force of eighty gorkas and on the twenty eighth of march set out to the rescue their progress was at first very slow for the enemy had blocked the road with twisted wire ropes and trunks of trees frequently while the soldiers were busy removing these obstacles they received a sudden call to arms to drive off the lurking foe over and over again would the little force have been annihilated but for the untiring zeal and prompt courage of the leader 
at length after a toilsome march of two days the small village of palel was reached here the enemy had collected in large numbers and a stubborn resistance was expected events however turned out otherwise for after a few shots had been exchanged the manipuris turned and fled the gurkhas pursued them for about three miles and took several prisoners then from one of the captives grant heard that the chief commissioner and those with him had been put to death as soon as darkness had settled down grant was again in motion marching all night he arrived at tobol early on the following morning here he found about a thousand of the enemy occupying a strong position on the opposite bank of a river having given the necessary orders for the attack the dauntless lieutenant dashed into the river at the head of his men twenty minutes after the firing of the first shot the enemy's trenches were captured following up this brilliant success the gurkhas carried five lines of walls and hedges in a similar dashing style before the last wall was reached the enemy were in full retreat grant then took up a position which he fortified as well as possible with the materials at his disposal after two hours sleep he again busied himself in strengthening the walls of his little fort by piling up rice baskets piles and ration sacks filled with earth even the lieutenant's pillow-case was made to do duty as a sandbag next day he received a letter from some prisoners at manipur beseeching him to withdraw his force or they would all be put to death grant replied that he was quite willing to retire if the prisoners were set at liberty and suitable hostages given for their safety but on no other conditions would he move a single step backwards this arrangement did not please the manipuris who tried to put the lieutenant off but he remained inflexible for four days the negotiations went on but no agreement could be arrived at then evidently with the intention of terrifying grant into accepting his terms the senapati sent word that he had three thousand men who would soon make an end of grant and his gurkhas to this the lieutenant replied that he did not care even if he had five thousand at dawn on the sixth of april the enemy renewed the attack and made most determined efforts to carry the position but they were met at all points by a rapid and well-directed fire creeping out of the fort with ten gurkhas grant made a brilliant sally and after dispersing a large body of the manipuris returned without loss to the fort some time afterwards he again went out accompanied by seven men and dislodged some of the enemy who were firing on our position from behind a hedge this having been accomplished grant found himself as he expressed it in a bit of a hole for thirty or forty were in a corner behind a wall six feet high over which they were firing at us there was no help for it the wall had to be cleared so they charged and after the hottest three minutes on record succeeded in their object when grant returned to the camp after this achievement he found himself face to face with a new danger ammunition was running short the following two days were a period of comparative inaction for the manipuris had learned by experience the danger of approaching within range of the rifles on the ninth of april grant received orders to retire 
that night during a terrible thunderstorm he set out and early on the following morning joined some troops that had been sent out to meet him the two parties then returned together to Palau. grant spoke very highly of the gallant conduct of the gurkhas under his command and the gurkhas said how could we be beaten under grant sahib he is a tiger in fight grant received the victoria cross for conspicuous bravery and devotion to his country Menapur was afterwards occupied by british troops order was restored and those who had been concerned in the murder of the officers were brought to justice and punished End of chapter 24chapter 25 of stories of the victoria cross by frank mundell this librivox recording is in the public domain in south africa the biggest english war of recent times has proved that britons will still do and dare for their country and their comrades from the commencement of the war to the time when this is being written in the early spring of 1901, nearly 40 awards of the coveted cross have been made to soldiers of all ranks engaged in it. It has been pointed out in Parliament that, if the cross is going to be distributed at this rapid rate, it will cease to have its unique value, and it has been contended that for a man to rescue a wounded comrade left on the field even though he does so under a deadly rain of bullets is nothing more than is to be expected of the average briton comment on this question must of necessity be debarred from these pages but the crosses which have been gained for the rescue of fallen comrades in the fight are the reward of such conspicuous gallantry inspired as much by brotherly pity as by the instinctive sense of duty that they well deserve a place in this book at colenso one of the earlier actions in the war the wounded of the fourteenth and fifteenth batteries of the royal field artillery were placed in sheltered corners in a donga close behind the guns there they lay suffering keen physical pain some of them in the agonies of death to move from behind the sheltered positions was to be the target of hundreds of boer marksmen and to add to the troubles of the sufferers there was no one in the donga to dress or bind their wounds a message was sent to the rear asking for a medical officer and soon major william babti of the royal army medical corps rode out to undertake the duty his horse was hit three times but he reached the donga and shortly afterwards he was busily engaged in tending the fallen soldiers from one to the other he went performing his much-needed offices under a heavy rifle fire strange to say he was not once hit and later in the day he was one of those who rescued the ill-fated lieutenant roberts son of the commander-in-chief under a heavy fire these intrepid deeds made him a worthy recipient of the honour of the cross on the fifth of january nineteen hundred a reconnaissance in force by our soldiers was taking place near colesburg lieutenant now captain sir john milbank was retiring under fire with a small patrol of the tenth hussars whilst keeping a keen lookout in the direction of the enemy he sustained a severe wound in the thigh and almost simultaneously he observed that the pony of one of his men had fallen exhausted leaving the soldier at the mercy of some boars 
who had dismounted in order to take more deadly aim lieutenant milbank did not hesitate in spite of his dreadful wound he rode out into the hail of lead took the man up onto his horse and galloped triumphantly with him back into camp and comparative safety thus adding his name to the glorious list of heroes shortly before this sergeant martineau of the protectorate regiment had distinguished himself by rescuing a fallen comrade the deed was done during the retirement from the fight at game tree the result of a brilliant sortie from besieged mafeking the order to retire had been given when sergeant martineau noticed that corporal le camp was lying helpless about ten yards from the boer trenches struck down by a boer bullet about a hundred and fifty yards from the trenches there were some bushes he believed that if only he could get his comrade into the shelter afforded by them scant though it was he might be able to staunch the blood that was flowing all too quickly from his wounds the thought was no sooner conceived than it was put into execution running quickly to the corporal he half carried half dragged him to the bushes and applied the bandages so much needed a boar bullet struck him in the side the next might be yet more deadly but he still continued his careful tendance of the helpless man again came the order to retire and he picked the corporal up once more and tottered along with him another bullet and yet another jarred his frame and he sank to the ground exhausted but they were now in the ranks he and his helpless comrade and willing hands secured the safety of both sergeant martineau got the cross but possibly he would exchange even that for his arm which had to be amputated at the shoulder at the same fight and under exactly the same circumstances trooper ramsden of the protectorate regiment won the cross by carrying his brother away out of range of the boer bullets the fifth dragoon guards share the honours for gallantry of this sort on october the thirtieth eighteen ninety nine second lieutenant john norwood went out from ladysmith in charge of a small patrol composed of men of his regiment suddenly a murderous fire was opened on them from the enemy who were posted on a ridge six hundred yards distant the patrol had not come out to fight neither were they as yet cornered there was therefore only one thing to do they retired at full speed but lieutenant norwood saw that one of his men had dropped and he rode back a distance of three hundred yards to where the fallen trooper lay dismounted lifted the man on to his back and leading his horse with one hand walked out of the lead storm which never ceased an instant luckily he was not hit so that he has nothing to discount the delight of possessing the decoration on march the thirteenth nineteen hundred a small party of the tenth hussars having destroyed the railway north of bloemfontein found that their path to the camp lay through the boer lines in the early dawn they set out on their perilous journey the enemy's piquets lay concealed in a deep spruit the first of a series which the hussars had to cross they outnumbered the british by four to one it might have been ten to one for aught they knew only their path lay across the spruits cautiously they advanced to the first and when within a short distance of it they discovered that it was only to be entered in single file who should be the first to venture 
no time was to be lost the piquet might become aware of their presence at any moment might know of it and be waiting finger on trigger for the first figure to come into sight there is always a man in a british regiment who will take the post where the greatest danger lies sergeant engelhart pushed forward and dashed into the spruit closely followed by the others the piquet were taken completely by surprise they hesitated whether to fly or to fight were the british strong in numbers they did not know until the little party had dashed through their midst and were well away out of the spruit then they recovered themselves and followed in hot pursuit one two more spruits had been successfully passed the fourth was attempted but it was tearing work for the horses and sapper webb could not persuade his steed to attempt the fourth bank the rifle fire from the enemy was now heavy and shells were falling more quickly every minute but the man who had dashed into the first spruit so courageously was not the man to leave a comrade behind he turned back to sapper webb's assistance it took some time to get the hussar and his tired horse out of the spruit and the danger increased momentarily at last however he was successful the top was gained and covering webb's retreat sergeant engelhart returned to the party who pushed on without further hindrance to their own lines to tell of another candidate for the cross private bisdy of the tasmanian imperial bushman gained his cross by helping his horseless officer on the first of september nineteen hundred he was one of an advanced scouting party they were passing through a rocky defile near warm bad when suddenly the enemy opened fire from an ambuscade at very short range six out of the party there were only eight in all were hit the two accompanying officers being both wounded private bisdy offered the officer his stirrup leather to help him out of action but the wounded man needed more support than that whereupon in spite of the bullets that were raining round them thick and fast he coolly dismounted placed the officer on his own horse mounted behind him and rode safely out of range in the same skirmish the other officer lieutenant wiley returned the compliment paid to his brother in command by rescuing one of his men seeing that the man was badly wounded in the leg and that his horse had been shot under him he offered him his own horse while he took up a position behind a rock himself and began firing to cover the retreat of the rest of the party he ran a great risk of being cut off from his men even if he did not fall a victim to one of the bullets that were whizzing past him but things turned out well for him and he escaped it was a gallant deed and surely deserved the cross for it undoubtedly saved one man from death or capture while it probably did the same for the rest of the party another hero in the cause of mercy was lieutenant parsons of the essex regiment at Paderberg on february the eighteenth on the south bank of the modder river a private belonging to his regiment fell wounded and lay helpless under the full fire of the enemy he tried to crawl under cover but received another bullet wound in the stomach and rolled over incapable of further effort lieutenant parsons braved the fire and went to his assistance the man's wounds were so terrible that it was impossible to move him without dressing them and this the lieutenant proceeded to do 
the wounded man begged for water and twice the lieutenant went down to the river bringing back with him the grateful draught his efforts were rewarded with success he managed to carry the sufferer to a place of safety he was recommended by his superior officer for the cross but poor fellow he never lived to receive it for he was killed while displaying great gallantry at Driefontein. still another instance of devotion to comrades in arms is that of captain towes of the gordon highlanders at the deadly slaughter of majors fontaine he was noticed by his commanding officer in the terrible panic of that disastrous retirement close up in the front of the firing line assisting colonel downman who had received a mortal wound this together with later events earned for him the cross on the thirtieth of the following april with twelve men he took up a position on mount thaber away from any supporting contingent a party of a hundred boers made for the plateau simultaneously with the small party of british neither party expected to meet the other and until they found themselves separated by only a hundred yards each party thought themselves unopposed in the possession of the hill the boers perceived that they were the stronger party and advanced up to within forty yards calling on captain towes to surrender possibly had it not been for this insult the captain would have thought it wise to retire but his only answer in the circumstances was to give a ringing command to his men to fire and as an example he himself commenced and not only did he fire but he charged forward with his twelve men against the hundred and fifty boars until they wavered and fell back and the situation was saved but captain towser's victoria cross was dearly bought for in that short deadly encounter both his eyes were shattered he will never look upon his well-earned prize such are some of the instances in which british soldiers have defied death to go to the help of brother soldiers this comradeship may be a common british attribute but all the same it is deserving of the highest reward that can be conferred we now turn to some other winners of the cross who gained the distinction in a somewhat different manner at colenso before mentioned the guns of the fourteenth and sixty-sixth batteries of the royal field artillery were drawn up five hundred yards in front of a donga a raking infantry fire at close range was directed on them and not one single officer or gunner remained at his post all had been wounded or killed the guns were deserted behind in the donga lay the wounded some of them with their lives ebbing silently but surely away while major william Baptai, whose honoured name we have already recorded flitted from one to another giving such rough and ready tendance as was possible meanwhile word went along that the guns were in danger of being captured captain congreve of the rifle brigade lieutenant the hon f h s roberts son of the commander-in-chief of the king's royal rifle corps and corporal nurse of the sixty sixth battery royal field artillery resolved to save them if it were possible hooking a team to a limber they sallied forth into the shell and bullet swept open and attempted to limber up a gun but the feat was impossible captain congreve wounded ere he could begin slipped into a temporary shelter to gain breathing space no sooner was he there however than he saw the ill-fated lieutenant fall to the ground badly wounded 
again he came out and brought in the younger man suffering from three fearful wounds from which he never recovered he himself was shot through the leg through the toe of his boot grazed on the elbow and on the shoulder and his horse was shot in three places strangely corporal nurse escaped without hurt the cross was awarded to all three of these gallant soldiers though that of the younger officer whose prospects had been so fair was handed a melancholy relic of the dead to his sorrowing parents lord roberts heard of his son's death just before he went out from england captain reed of the seventh battery royal field artillery also was awarded the cross for a subsequent effort to rescue the guns on the occasion of the action at corn spruit on march the thirty first nineteen hundred two batteries of the royal horse artillery were retiring together from thab and chu towards bloemfontein the enemy had formed an ambush at corn spruit and before the main body were aware of their presence they had captured the greater portion of the baggage train and five out of the six guns of the leading battery when the alarm was given q battery was within three hundred yards of the spruit at once major phipps hornby who was in command gave the order to wheel about and the battery moved quickly off under a heavy fire a wheel horse of one of the guns was shot and the gun had to be abandoned together with a wagon the horses of which were killed the remainder of the battery made for some unfinished railway buildings about eleven hundred and fifty yards from the spruit where they formed up and came into action for a considerable time they continued to fire on the enemy but at last they received an order to retire the teams of horses had been removed for safety to behind the buildings and major phipps hornby foreseeing the difficulty of hooking them on while under fire ordered his men to run the guns and their limbers by hand round to the back of the buildings and hook the teams on there the men responded gallantly assisted by some officers and men belonging to the mounted infantry and directed by the major they by superhuman efforts and dauntless courage succeeded in getting four out of the five guns round to the back under cover one or two limbers also they managed to withdraw but the work was so exhausting that it was impossible to do more and at last it became necessary to risk the horses volunteers were called for from among the drivers and were quickly forthcoming soon only one gun and one limber remained but as all the horses had been sacrificed these after four more unsuccessful attempts were abandoned meanwhile the rescued guns had been sent on one at a time and although they had to be dragged across two difficult spruits and round the head of a donga within seven or eight hundred yards of the boer guns they were triumphantly carried into a place of safety and the battery was reformed it was a daring feat everyone who took part in this gallant act was entitled to the cross but there were so many of them that the commander-in-chief at the seat of war decided that rule thirteen of the victoria cross warrant must be availed of in this case this rule provides that the cross shall be awarded to the battery or contingent collectively and that a cross should be given to one officer to be elected by his brother officers who shared in the feat one non-commissioned officer elected by his brother non-coms and one trooper or gunner or private as the case may be 
also to be elected by his fellow sharers in the glory now there were only two officers unwounded and therefore available for the work of saving the guns one of these was major phipps hornby and the other was captain humphreys each of these had been equally conspicuous by his gallantry and fearlessness each was equally generous in character and the result was that they nominated one another it is a pity that under the circumstances both could not have had a cross but it was eventually decided to make the award to the senior of the two that is major phipps hornby the cross for the non-commissioned officers is held by sergeant parker and those for the gunners and drivers by gunner lodge and driver glassock the story of how captain fitzclarence of the royal fusiliers city of london regiment won the victoria cross is as follows on october the fourteenth eighteen ninety nine the captain set out from mafeking with a squad from the protectorate regiment the men were brave enough but they were not trained soldiers and had never been in action their work was to assist an armoured train which had left the besieged town they found themselves greatly outnumbered by the enemy and for a lack of discipline they were almost in a state of panic then it was that the cool courage of captain fitzclarence inspired them with such confidence that they inflicted a severe defeat on the enemy a fortnight afterwards captain fitzclarence commanded a night sortie from the besieged town advancing silently across the open they reached the boer trenches and attacked with the bayonet killing many the captain was wounded in this encounter but that did not prevent him from leading his squad out to yet another fight during which he was severely wounded in both legs these are some of the latest examples of the way in which our soldiers by their ready and self-sacrificing courage have qualified themselves for this the most coveted of military and naval rewards the cross for valour end of chapter twenty five end of stories of the victoria cross by frank mundell